Hey everyone, today I have a very special video to share with you. On the night of September 15th, just after midnight, so actually on the in the early hours of the 16th, I was stuck in a quarantine hotel after returning from Hong Kong to mainland China, Shenzhen. And suddenly, I jumped out of bed, quickly combed my hair and turned my camera on because there was an opportunity to have a discussion with Paul Mooney, a Vietnam War vet and longtime mainstream media journalist. As many of my subscribers know, I have a pretty big issue with most mainstream media journalists, particularly those who cover China and either don't know about or don't cover certain important details and context. However, in the interest of having a respectful discussion without it descending into an argument, I wanted to minimize the feeling that I was scrutinizing him specifically too much, and I tried to speak about mainstream media as a third party. Paul himself, uh, being very respectful and pleasant to speak with, of course, made it uh, made keeping this exchange productive extremely easy, a very easy task. Unfortunately, afterwards, when it came to asking each side to produce materials to support the claims we made during our impromptu discussion, which neither of us prepared for, it's important to note, it descended into a conflict and I was blocked by him on Twitter. Now, I don't want to give too much of a commentary on this because you'd only be getting my side of the story and that's not fair to Paul. Uh, you know, in contrast, my discussion with Rushan Abbas that was quite different because uh, after our interview, she got one of her staffers, without disclosing that they were her staff, to start publicly attacking me, which is why you saw a bit more of a post-interview commentary from me. But anyways, let me just briefly explain at least how this conversation came about. So I was checking Twitter as I was getting ready to go to sleep, and I saw a conversation happening between Paul Mooney, um, who I had previously been blocked by because um, I had uh, it was in the previous month. I was taking issue with some of his tweets and sharing a different perspective. So I was looking at this conversation happening through a second browser. Um, but Paul did actually later on apologize for blocking me and said that during that period of time, a lot of people were piling on to him. So it may have been a mistake. But regardless, in the new discussion I saw unfolding on Twitter, he was inviting people to publicly debate him. Now, I sent a link, a DM link to one of the people interacting with him by the name of Mission Critical. And uh, username Mission Critical, and I gave them a link to my StreamYard account, and, a, and I set up a room for them in order for them to facilitate this conversation. So the link was publicly posted for anyone to join and to observe, and Paul homed in on Mission Critical specifically. But Mission Critical sent me a DM and said that he can't do it right now because he's on a golf course, but Paul is ready to go. So this is where this is the point where Paul really deserves a lot of respect. When I showed up, uh, he didn't know what he didn't know what mission, mission Critical looked like or who he was. And he wouldn't have known if I didn't tell him I wasn't him. But I told him up front. I said that I was not him, and I was actually somebody that he had previously blocked. And he was under no obligation to continue that discussion. But he did. Because neither of us prepared, please do excuse both of us when we mention a few things that we don't remember the exact name of. Um, and this caused a couple of small misunderstandings also. As an example, I, I realized I wasn't listening carefully enough at one point when he was trying to mention an academic in Canada by the name of Sean Zhang, but I thought he was talking about Nathan Rooster in Australia. After our conversation, Paul actually said he no longer wanted to make our discussion public initially, but before blocking me a second time, he gave me permission to do so. The reason you're seeing this video now so late is because out of respect, I wanted to wait and see if he wanted to change his mind again. I had no way of communicating with him directly anymore, but I waited nearly a quarter of a year to give him time to reach out if he wanted to just change his mind again. So when watching this, if you have any problems with what I've said, please do mention it in the comments. I welcome you to do so. If you have any issues with what Paul said, feel free to discuss it, but don't seek him out to pile on him for anything specific. Once again, remember this was unprepared, and I really think we should be encouraging more discussions like this. They don't happen enough, and Paul was one of the very few people who was willing to make it happen. Regardless of uh, whose arguments and whose points you connect with more here, this is a great way to see the thoughts, ideas, and, and feelings, and logic happening behind the scenes on two people who are on two very different sides of an issue, and see what happens when those ideas meet. With that said, I will leave you with our discussion, totally uncut. Enjoy, and I'll see you in the next video. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to talk about the same okay. topic. Sure, so. sure, sure, sure. Yeah, because, I mean, we were, uh, uh, thanks thanks for joining, uh, by the way. But, um, yeah, we were talking because I was curious. You know, I, I saw your post show up um, 
under Jin Jing's posts, and you were talking about the problem with uh, terrorism, Uyghur terrorism. Right. That really, yeah, that it didn't really exist. But when I shared some of those videos for you, because those came directly from ISIS, um, those videos, you were saying that it was CCP propaganda. So I was wondering if you wanted to which, which, expand on that a little bit. Which videos are you talking about? I don't remember now. Uh, there were a few. So there was one that um, were of the kids. There were there there were some kids in a classroom, and they were being taught. Um, and it was a, it was a video that was released by uh, by uh, ISIS, but it was republished by ABC. ABC had posted it. So what I found personally, what I found was there were a lot of media outlets that were willing to post this stuff before there was this big uh, what I call like a a, a push to whitewash the terrorism <laughs> issue from Xinjiang, right. uh, they were more willing to admit it back then. Uh, but after the U.S. Uh, delisted ETIM from the terrorist list, I personally noticed, and I don't know if you've been paying attention to the same thing, I personally noticed a lot of people coming out saying they never existed. This is why we, we yeah. you know, removed them. Well, right. actually, there were two. Sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll, let me clarify. There were two, there were two things, uh, two angles they took. Right. One was people were saying that they never existed. And uh, the other was, I think this was the State Department's official line, was that they don't exist anymore. Right. And the thing that the thing that that confused me, uh, the thing that that uh, uh, what made me confused about that was that the Tamil Tigers are still on the terrorist list and they didn't even exist for even longer. So I just wanted to know, how do you process this whole thing? Yeah. Like, how, how are you? Yeah. First of all, um, if you talk to any of the leading Xinjiang scholars, James Millward, uh, Gardner Bovingdon, Sean Roberts, they'll all tell you that they never heard of ETIM until 2001 when, when China mentioned it, right? Um, they said they'd never heard of it before. Um, they said no, no Uyghur organizations have claimed to be ETIM. There's no record of anybody. Um, there are other groups, but nobody ever claimed to be ETIM. And, uh, and what they say is that if ETIM ever existed, it was a handful of people. They never posed a real threat to China. Also, ETIM has never taken credit for a single terrorist incident. So I'm not saying they're not Uyghurs in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Syria. They exist. It, there, there are something like two or 3,000 members of the Turkish Islamic Party in Syria. But I think a lot of people confuse ETIM with, with, uh, with the TIP. The other thing is that in 2001 or 2002, the U.S. added um, ETIM to this uh, watch list, and the U.N. did too at the instigation of the U.S. because the U.S. wanted Chinese support for um, the Great War on Terror and for the invasion of Iraq. Um, there's no U.S. intelligence. If you look at what the U.S. said, they use the same exact statistics that are in the Chinese white paper. Um, there's no indication so, so, that yeah. the U.S. did its own intelligence on this. So, so there, there are press briefings where U.S. generals themselves in yeah. 2018 were saying that they were doing airstrikes on ETIM. Yeah. Yeah, um, and, they, and, yeah, and the general even clarified, they said the ETIM is a terrorist group that operates out of Xinjiang. They were training with the Taliban and they did airstrikes on them. And yeah. they did regular airstrikes on them in Xinjiang. So why would, and this is as late as 2018, way after that, I yeah. know what you're talking about. They wanted Chinese support for that right. vote. Right. But right. why as late as 2018 would they be saying and acknowledging and saying, yeah, we're, we're, we're yeah. airstriking yeah. ETIM? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll, I'll give you my, my number one is, uh, I have to double check this, but I think that that general qualified his statement a few days later. I need to go back and check. Um, but the other thing is that, if you look at a lot of the um, intel people, people who are experts on terrorism, they all talk about ETIM, but none of them speak Uyghur. None of them have ever spoken to a Uyghur. None of them can read a Uyghur. Um, I think China put out this story, the U.S. put on the list, and so intel people who make their money from writing reports started doing this. If, if, um, and I'd like to, I'm actually, I'm trying to follow up in, in, with the Pentagon on this. I don't, I, don't, I think he was ignorant. I think a lot of people in the U.S. government are, are ignorant about this. Uh, and I don't think there were repeated attacks. I only saw an article about one attack. All right. And now, so, I mean, I'm wondering if we're getting kind of caught in semantics, because at mm -hmm. the end of the day, if there are 10,000 Uyghurs in Syria, 3, um, you know, 3,000. That, that's what I've seen. Yeah. Yeah. The number. Okay, so so let's say I mean uh, ten thousand. What I heard was a, con a conservative okay. figure, okay. but nevertheless, if there if there are these people fighting there, uh, carrying out jihad in Syria, 
whether, you know, whatever banner they're operating under, I know some of them join, uh, join Nursra, uh, some of them are aligned with Al-Qaeda. Um, at the end of the day, it shows that there are, there is a problem where there are radicalized people coming out of Xinjiang, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of what, what brand name we're going to give them. So is that, is, isn't that a, leg a legitimate issue? Uh, yeah, that would be a legitimate issue. Um, but no, you know, when I spoke, I spoke to Shizak Kor, the uh, Israeli scholar, expert on terrorism, and he told me that, and this is, uh, he talked to all the Uyghur scholars. I talk to them, you know, once or twice a year. I read what they write. They basically say that the vast, th there's terrorist incidents in China. There's no denying that. No one denies that. But that most of them are done with crude weapons. They're not, they're not organized. They're not well-funded. Uh, they're not sophisticated. They're done with Molotov cocktails, you know, uh, machetes and things like this. There's no serious threat by any organized group in, in Xinjiang. And what Shizak told me was that because the Chinese security is so intense there that nobody could really get any kind of real operation off. So my point is, I'm, I've never denied that there's terrorism. What I'm saying is there's no justification for in, imprisoning a million or more people. There's no justification for shutting down or, or, or taking down mosques. There's no justification for taking children from their parents. It's, it's overkill. And I believe that China has a vested interest in exaggerating what's going on uh, so that they can justify the abuses against the Uyghurs. That's my main point. Do you think that the U.S. also has a vested interest in exaggerating what's going on in Xinjiang because there is a propaganda war against China and they are ultimately trying to undermine what they're doing on the one on one road, one belt initiative and things like that. So would you would you concede that there is an initiative uh, and, a, and a desire from the U.S. to also want to over exaggerate what's actually happening? I don't see that. I mean, first of all, I, I mean, my information doesn't come from the U.S. government. My information comes from things that I that I read from other sources, from other journalists, from from uh, from research institutes, and from the Uyghur scholars. Um, I don't see the U.S. having any kind of campaign. I've not. Uh, they might censor China or ask them to, to to kind of you know to 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 be more humane. But I haven't seen China. I haven't seen the U.S. Um, posting anything that exaggerates what's going on there. Like maybe it exists, but I haven't seen it. And I don't think it has much impact, doesn't impact. Yeah, me. I mean, they, they have approved $300 million per year for the next seven years in basically anti-China propaganda. And I mean, this isn't something new, right? I mean, ever what, since the, the sorry, the, you, do you want to? What's the source for that? Uh, from the State Department, the US State Department. You, 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 I, I really doubt this. I don't think they'd actually say we have a program to, um, if, you know, if so, let's say that uh, I mean I can try to find it while we're speaking here I, and bring I, it up on the screen. It, but I, if that were true, if if you were to go back afterwards and find out that that was true, would you then uh, would you then concede that it does seem like there is a vested interest from the U.S. to want to over exaggerate issues in China if they're willing to spend three hundred million dollars a year for the next seven years yeah, yeah. on. Uh, an anti-China propaganda campaign. Would that be a logical conclusion you, if what I said was true? Do you really think the State Department would put out a statement saying we're going to spend $300 million on anti-China propaganda? Does that make sense? Uh, it's called the Countering Chinese Influence Fund. There is authorized to be an, uh, appropriated $300 million for each fiscal year from 2022 to 2026 for the Countering Chinese Influence Fund uh, to counter the malign influence of the Chinese uh, Communist Party globally. Then they go on in other parts to talk about how that funding is going into USAGM. So USAGM is the, uh, is the host of uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, basically all of these propaganda outlets that push the American uh, view on things things worldwide. So there is, I mean, there, it's approved. There's $300 million. That's the name of the fund. Um, Do they use the word propaganda? Uh, it, it, well, they talk about, yeah, uh, I, I got to find the exact thing. So basically what it is, it's a, it's an, it's an influence fund. So influence comes through various, uh, various means, but a lot of it is pushing out this story and that's why it's going to USAGM. So USAGM is a news outlet. Yeah. So yeah. when USAGM gets that funding, it's to push a certain story. Yeah. yeah. And, and you, what, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So so all I'm saying is if you I, I mean, I know you're not I, I'm not trying to like surprise things on you and say right. you, you didn't know about this like right. a gotcha. There's no way. I, I mean, you might know some things that I don't know also. But all I'm saying is if you look into this and you see that, indeed, they're going to spend three hundred million dollars per year on an influence campaigns. It seems like they really want to uh, over exaggerate some of the issues in it, China. It, 
except that there's no proof that this is an influence or a propaganda campaign. It's, it might be. It, the, it's the bill name. The bill name is influence. It's in. That's the actual name of the program. Is the influence fund that? But in any case, um, the people I know that are that that are been covering, been researching this for 20, 30 years, um, don't get their information from from. I just read Sean Roberts' book, The War on the Uyghurs. If you haven't read it, I suggest you read it. Yeah, I have. I have. Yeah. He doesn't quote a single U.S. government source. He talks. He went to. Turkey and interviewed Uyghurs, and he's been following this, and he's and he's he's analyzed every single video that came out from from TIP. Um, the, the, yeah, the thing that was shocking for me on his book was that he was talking about the the tragedy of Uyghur kids in China learning the national language Chinese. Right. And then when he 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 had to admit, and actually that's a very very valuable thing too, because when I shared that video with you, that ISIS video for you, you yeah. said it was Chinese propaganda. But actually, Sean Roberts, even in his own book, even yeah. admitted that there are video showing that these kids are training with ISIS and training with these people. Yeah. But the thing that was shocking for me was the way that he framed it was saying, but he added a, but he's saying, yes, okay, they're training with terrorists pretty much, but it seems like they have a really good community and they have holiday parties and stuff like that. So that's what shocked me on that book. And I actually asked him the question and he mm -hmm. didn't reply to it. So do you, do you see a problem with that when kids are being trained with the terrorists and he's saying, yeah, they're being trained with terrorists, but they have really cool holiday parties and they seem like they have a good community. I, I I don't think there's more than a handful of kids. I don't I don't know how it's being trained by terrorists. Um, I think it's exaggerated. Uh, I don't remember. I, I do remember him raising this issue. Um, I I found him to be quite objective. He doesn't try to uh, play down the the the, the number of, of Uyghurs uh, in Syria or that they're fighting against the the government. You know, he's quite open about that. Um, you know, um, the uh, he he's at, he's watched every one of those videos. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I just don't, I don't, I don't see this, this video of the children being a major thing. And, um, uh, so, so, hold on, so if you, if you, if you find out that these kids are really being trained by ISIS people, you're saying that you don't think that's a, a big deal. I, I don't think there's proof that they're being trained by ISIS people that it's still going on or that it was ever really much of a, of a real training thing. I mean, where do you think? I mean, those are because, you know, actually, if somebody goes deep enough, you can actually go into ISIS's telegram groups. You can get into ETIM's mm -hmm. uh, telegram groups and you can see what they're posting. So ETIM is coming out with new recruitment videos like they're they're They've got new recruitment videos. It's made no videos. ETIM. They have. I, I mean, I can I can show you right now. I've, I, I can show you using ETIM with the Turkish Islamic Party. I'll show. I'll, I'll pull it up right now. I'll yeah, I mean, it, it, it's yeah. So they're rebranded to TIP. China still decides to call it ETIM, but let me show you right here the the video. Hold on a second. You get the idea. I, I stopped it early, but mm -hmm. I mean, who, this is this is from ETIM. Do you do you think this is Chinese propaganda uh, or? Well, it could be. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't see any. I don't read Arabic. I don't. I don't know what the what the. What, do you read Arabic or do you speak? I don't know, but I have a friend. I, I interviewed somebody who used to be part of Al Qaeda, and uh, when they were in Al Qaeda, they were learning their bomb making from ETIM. Um, and I, I have a I have a two hour about a two hour interview with that ETM person. Was, ETM was training Al Qaeda in bomb making. There was somebody from uh, Al Qaeda who said that they were the most proficient in these things. So they, they had a network because they were very, very closely associated with Al Qaeda and they were reaching out to each other. They all knew each other and bomb making is what they did. The guy who I interviewed in particular, he was mostly involved in media. I mean, it's very, a very sophisticated operation. Even when they're making their uh, recruitment videos, they have a certain way that the flag needs to be positioned right. to fly yeah. and things like that. But yeah, no, he, he had direct communication with ETIM. He's in their groups. ETIM yeah. ha still has an active 
active website. Their WhatsApp official phone number is a California based phone number. Like these guys are, are, I mean, it's very hard. If you, if you dig deep enough, it's very hard to deny that these guys uh, I- exist. And even like, like I said, to remove ETIM from the terrorist list because they don't exist anymore. That's not even a valid reason. Like I said, the Tamil Tigers are still on the terrorist list and they haven't existed for even longer. Yeah. There's an ulterior yeah. motive going yeah. on here. As I said, ETIM should have never been put on the list because the U.S. had no proof that they existed. They, in the U.N., they totally accepted what China said. So them being on any list or taken off is meaningless. You know, they were put on the list for political reasons and they were probably taken off for political reasons. You know, I think Trump. Did- what, what do you think? That, that's what I want to hone in on. What yeah. political reasons do you think they were taken off? For? I just think Trump wanted to stick it to Xi Jinping. OK, I don't. Think- well, let, uh, let me talk about your because I mean, when you're asking me for my, my references, I, I, I can tell you the, the, the name of the bill and things like that. So when you talk about one million Uyghurs, do you know do you know the source of that when you're talking about one million in uh, detention? I've seen it in dozens of, you know, uh, you know, comments by by scholars, Uyghur scholars. There's a Chinese grad student in Canada who's done satellite uh, studies and he's identified Australia, Australia. Australia OK, he's identified prison camps. Um why would you? Yeah, he, you know, he's also the same guy. He's also the same guy who can't even identify a WeChat uh, QR pay code. Uh, he yeah. saw a WeChat green QR pay code and he said this is a tracking code for the police to track them. This guy makes things up randomly. Yeah. But I, I mean, I can tell you, too, because I looked into the one million number. Right. The original number came from eight witness testimonies mm-hmm. based on what they said. And then it was uh, extrapolated across the entire region of Xinjiang. I mean, that is not if, if you were to I know you might not have gone to the original source, but if you find out that that was indeed the original source, eight witness testimonies that was then ex- extrapolated across the entire Xinjiang region, region, would you agree that that's a little bit problematic? How, ma- how many other people I just posted two things yesterday uh, to, to, to your buddy um, where Uyghur people who had been in the camp are making statements last year, I'm writing a book on Xinjiang. Last year, I traveled across Canada. There's quite a few Uyghurs in Canada and down the East Coast. I interviewed maybe 20, 25 Uyghurs. Every one of them had a a relative that had disappeared, who they couldn't find. Um, Some of them, you know, had had lost relatives in the camps. Um, One guy showed me on his iPhone, he pulled out and showed me a list of 70 names of relatives um, and friends that were in prison. Um, To me, there's no doubt that the prisons exist. These people, you know, and when I interviewed these people, they actually cried. They actually cried. These are not actors. They have no. Yeah, I mean, I mean, Tersene, uh, the most famous uh, person who's crying in these witness testimonies is Tersene Ziawadin. Uh, She was first. uh, So her first interview was with BuzzFeed. And her first interview with BuzzFeed, she said she uh, didn't experience any physical abuse. And it was actually all right. Overall, they still had their phone. They were eating in the canteen. She then upgraded her story to say that she was uh, beaten, raped. She witnessed all these things. And then she got a spot on BBC. The problem was when they showed her passport and they actually uh, uh, you listened to her story, it conflicts with each other. Her passport was renewed while she was apparently in these concentration camps. 4,000 people signed a petition, uh, petition to get BBC to answer why they uncritically pushed this story. They never answered it. CNN then re-aired it. But when CNN re-aired it, they blurred out her passport renewal date because it was a giant hole in her story. So... First of all, she left China legally through exit immigration. She had her passport renewed while she was apparently in the concentration camps. And her story has changed three times. This is the number one witness testimony. And she's being carted around similar to how Nayira, you know, with the fake testimony of the 14 year old girl crying on stage, saying that there were babies being thrown from incubators by Iraqi soldiers. Similar kind of a thing. Do you do you would you say that that's a massive red flag we've got going on here? No, no, I wouldn't. I mean, most Uyghurs have had their passports confiscated. So she didn't. So she didn't have her passport I, confiscated. Oh, she she I, had it renewed. She had a visa to exit the country. In prison, she renewed her visa. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's what. That's that's, that's what she's saying. That's what she exactly. That's exactly what I'm saying. So this is exactly what I want. So if you find that she said her passport or her passport renewal date on her passport that she provided shows that her passport was renewed during the period of time that she said she was under arrest. Would you still say it's her story, not my story? Impossible. Something's wrong with that story. I, if, I, we're, I think we're agreeing if, here. If, if you're right, it's one person. It doesn't mean they're all not telling the truth. Are you are you saying there are no camps at all? Is that your argument? 
Oh, there were re there. I visited. I visited with some of the locations. There, there, there are the vocational how, training centers. How did you vocational? How, how did you visit them? How were you able? I, to I went to I went to Xinjiang myself. To what capacity? By myself. I flew there. I booked a ticket. You, I went there. You were able to visit the camps. I went. I went to the locations. I, the the. I went, went. I went to. You went into the camps. Well, no, I, I went to the locations, the coordinates. I, I visited the coordinates, and those buildings are empty now. Okay. Uh, I, I doubt very much, having having been in China for 18 years, having been to Xinjiang four times, where I was followed every single place I went, I doubt very much that you got to these places. And I'm wondering, why would you make the effort? What's what? I mean, what's your background? Are you an academic? Why, 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 would it, why wouldn't I make the effort? I mean, everybody's why? talking about Xinjiang. Here's yeah. my problem. Here's yeah. my problem. The U.S. is now sanctioning Xinjiang. They're trying to put them back into poverty. They're telling them that their cotton is sanctioned. If you've been to Xinjiang and you've been to southern Xinjiang, you don't need me to tell you that ordinary Uyghurs have their own plots of land where they grow their own cotton and their families rely on this product. You, you don't need me to tell you that. Lots of Uyghurs have their right. own land and they grow and they have cotton, right? right. So. Now, they're trying to sanction them back into poverty. And what do they do all around the world? What's the purpose of sanctions? The purpose of sanctions is to, is, to, is to put people into a position where they are suffering and they want to rise up against their government. And also, the other problem we have on our hands, too, is the World Bank and all of these other organizations show that poverty and a lack of opportunity is the perfect environment to breed extremism. You put two and two together. The U.S. removes ETIM off of the terrorist list. They then try to sanction ordinary Uyghur people back into poverty. I have friends in Xinjiang. I have Kazakh friends. I have Uyghur friends. I have Han friends from uh, Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. I have an interest in this because I think it's atrocious what they're doing. The U.S. did something very similar in my mother's country of Guyana. When there was a government in place that they didn't like, they went in and they spurred ethnic tensions. And this is declassified documents, by the way. They went in and they spurred ethnic tensions between the people of African descent and Indian descent. And to this day, there are racial tensions between them just because the U.S. wanted to overthrow Chetty Jagan. So when I saw this stuff going in in China, I said, no, you know what? I'm not going to let the U.S. get away with this again. I'm going to go and see it for myself because there are ordinary Uyghur people like the German. There was a, a, a Uyghur student in Germany from Xinjiang who saw this propaganda and she spoke out against it on, on, on YouTube. And she said, listen, this is absolutely BS. You know what happened? People exposed her address. They started giving her death threats and she deleted her YouTube channel. So these voices are not getting out. If you think you're a Uyghur overseas and you can speak out against this narrative, no way. Absolutely not. It is too dangerous. So that's my that. So my position is from a humanitarian point of view to want to go in and, and debunk this bullshit. Yeah. About five years ago, I, I wrote a report for Reuters, a quite long report on how China intimidates mm -hmm. Uyghurs overseas. Um, we interviewed dozens of people in Europe, the U.S. and Canada. Um, they're all petrified. They're afraid to talk. They're afraid to use their names. Uh, they all well, the girl I'm talking about was petrified, not by the not yeah. by China. She was petrified by the people, that, the anti-China forces. OK, I don't doubt that happened. People are angry. But what I'm saying is China does does it on a far and China's government does this. This is not whatever happened to this woman. It wasn't the American government. It was probably other Uyghurs who were upset. Um, but um, it's not. But the Chinese government does this. Um, well, and, what's an example of like what, what like what what tactics do they use? What, what, what did you? They OK. Um, when they'll go to people's houses. So if they know like that you have a relative overseas who's involved in WUC or the Uyghur American Association, or the Uyghur, they'll go to your family, they'll threaten you. Um, my friends told me they're afraid to even call home and that their parents and relatives told them not to call home anymore because every time they get a call, the police make a visit. Um, Dolkan Isa's mother was put into a prison camp where she died. Um, you I, know, this is this is the trouble I, because I have a lot of uh, yeah. I mean, sorry, sorry. Go ahead. I spent three days. I rode I, I, with a Uyghur guy uh, who, who's a long distance truck driver who's been harassed. I rode with him from Tracy, California, back to um, Montreal. Um, he explained to me how he, he the, they kept pressuring him to go back. When he went back, uh, public security people pressured him to be a spy and other Uyghurs in the U.S. He basically, he only wanted to go back to his mother one more time. She was in his 80s. He was called in several times, was interrogated, was pressured. Um, he said, yes, yes, yes. Uh, he went back to Canada and um, he just kind of ignored them. Um, I've, I've spoken to a lot of Uyghurs whose families are... I
on your plate. Yeah. Uh, th this is the this is the problem we're going to have though, because I have a lot of when you were talking about no actual evidence of terrorism or weapons and things like that. I wanted to try to avoid using anecdotal stories because I have a lot of stories. Also, for example, uh, I know somebody who was transporting um, uh, uh, meat from the border regions into the inner regions of Kashgar, and they were using a they were using a strategy back then. This was this was a, quite early on. This was quite a long time ago where they would smuggle grenades and actual weapons underneath pork in trucks because they thought that the, the Chinese authorities would not check it because Uyghurs don't eat pork. And when this guy, he was a Han Chinese driver, was coming down the road, he heard a rattling in the back of his truck. And he went, he went around the back and he checked it and it's full of these weapons. And I asked him, it, well, it's his nephew who I know, and I asked him if he t reported it to the police. And he said, no way. I mean, he didn't want to risk getting killed. But the problem is, is... I, I don't know if you're going to believe you don't even believe that I went to, to go and visit uh, the outsides of these buildings that are empty. So that's why I want to stick. Let, no, just hear me out. Hear me out. I want to I want to take this a, a few steps back and let's base it on just the data that we have. So now what do you so are you are you in the camp of saying that there's an, an actual genocide, like a physical genocide going on or a cultural genocide? I'd say cultural genocide. Yeah. Cultural I would, what, what human genocide? What what aspects of the culture do you think are being eradicated? They they restrict who can go in the mosque. They restrict fam training of, of children and young people. I, I've talked to students. I've actually talked to students in Xinjiang who told me they were forced to eat during Ramadan. Um, I spoke to people who said they weren't allowed to wear a dopa. They weren't allowed to grow a beard. Women who told they weren't. I've, I've got a sign. I can send you a photo of it in a hotel in northeastern Xinjiang where they said wearing, um, uh, wearing kind of the uh, veils is, a, is, a, is an insult to other minorities and saying you can't do that. Uh, the niqab, the niqab, the niqab is, is banned in China. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And um, so, like, like it is in France. Yeah. yeah. So and, like, I mean, cause I was there, I was actually there during Ramadan and all of the restaurants that are famous for needing to line up and wait a really long time were pretty much empty. There were some Uyghurs uh, eating. And when I was talking to them, they uh, they observe a lot of the uh, Islamic practices more from a cultural point of view. While they don't fast, they they also don't eat pork. But mm -hmm. what was interesting from the stories that I heard is when these Salafist jihadists were taking over, they were afraid to go into these places and eat during Ramadan if they weren't observing that. They were also afraid to drink. And drinking in Uyghur culture goes back even earlier than Islam. They have a winemaking history that predates even, right. uh, even Islam. Right. So these Salafist jihadists were punishing Uyghurs because a lot of Uyghurs were killed also. I met the, I met the, uh, the, the imam of Idka Mosque. His, his father was stabbed outside of the back of the, uh, the mosque because mm -hmm. he didn't agree with these jihadis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that for, for me, that was when the real cultural genocide was going on, when this Salafist interpretation of Islam was coming in and being forced upon a group of people who are largely speaking a moderate Muslims. I mean, do you agree? Because I think that there there's a certain responsibility from the uh, from the China also. Actually, I, I don't even think that. I think even in the UN, there are responsibilities for a government to uh, uh, to create a safe environment for people where they can walk down the streets without having a fear of getting killed. Right. So, I mean, there there was there was a pretty massive issue that needed to be addressed also for the sake of the Uyghurs also. Would you, would you at least concede that? What's that? I mean, what's the, what? the, 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 the issue of the, the expansion of Salafist jihadism in Xinjiang, targeting these people, forcing a, a, a very strict version of Islam onto them. I, I haven't heard about that. I haven't heard of any kind of jihadism within, within Xinjiang. Um, Why do you think they were killing other Uyghurs then? There, how many how many other Uyghurs were killed? Was it an imam in the, in the, working for the we're, government? Were, we're talking we're talking about in the hundreds, and then there's some people who weren't killed, but they're uh, they're they're physically disabled for life. Uh, some of them have been burned. Some of them are missing legs. I mean, there there's there's plenty of them in in Xinjiang. I, I don't know about that. I've never heard about that before. I've heard of an imam. I, I heard of an imam being killed. I've heard of some being attacked, um, but primarily because for political reasons, because they represent the Chinese government. Um, before you mentioned grenades and guns, have there been any attacks where grenades were used or guns were used? Uh, guns, I'm not sure. That, I mean, that was, that was, we're talking about when he was going from the border regions. That was, uh, I think, like 20 years ago or something like that. I can't remember the exact date. But, I mean, regardless, at the end of the day, they were killing people. However they were doing it, they were actually killing people. And a lot of them were Uyghurs. And I, I think that what's important to note also is this doesn't happen within a bubble. Like, there are actual Salafist jihadists who want to uh, establish a caliphate. I mean, if you look in Kyrgyzstan, in Kyrgyzstan, in the southern region, the uh, Uzbek minority 
group, they have been the ones who are radicalized and are performing the terrorist attacks in that in, in that country also. But we don't we don't hear about that because it's not a geo, of a geopolitical interest to the U.S. I mean, we know that the U.S. picks and choose their targets. They're allies with Saudi Arabia with atrocious human rights abuses, but they're going after China. So I think we have to we have to at least concede that there are geopolitical reasons, first of all, that there's a focus on. Uh, on China and on Xinjiang. We, we, we may not come to an agreement that it's over exaggerated, but there definitely is a motive for wanting for the U.S. wanting to focus on Xinjiang specifically. Well, you know, like I, like I said before, I don't think any scholars or any journalists get their information about what's going on in Xinjiang from from uh, from the U.S. government. I never did. Um, no, I get- no scholars. Most of the scholars are fu- funded by the U.S. government. That's I mean, all of the all of these think tanks are connected. Do you, I mean, you know about the NED, right? The purpose yeah. of the NED and the NED. Yeah, I agree with them, but I, I doubt that. I, I don't. If you read what they're writing, and I've been reading all of these guys, I don't find any of the leading scholars making wild um, claims. I find that they concede where there's an issue. They all concede this terrorist incidents. Um, I don't see any of them. Um, pushing a U.S. line on this. And I don't even know what the U.S. line is because I haven't seen it. I've just heard the U.S. call for um, uh, better treatment of the Uyghurs. That's the only thing I've heard. I haven't seen the U.S. pushing really hard, pushing some false narrative or any narrative at all, you know, other than... Yeah, some- they've spent uh, $9 million in the last few years on Uyghur activist groups uh, through the NED alone. And there's a bunch of other programs as well. I mean, there's huge you know, money going into this. Uh, these are not terrorist groups. You think that only China has a right to say anything? The World Uyghur Congress, the Uyghurs don't have any right to organize themselves outside of China. Do you, do you think that they're? Do you think that they're funding groups to the similar amounts that are speaking up for uh, about the the human rights abuses in Saudi Arabia? All I'm trying to establish here is that there's a motive and a reason that they're spending this much money specifically on Xinjiang and ignoring everything else that's done elsewhere. It's Xinjiang. I mean, I know quite a few um, Chinese who've gotten funding from the NED. Oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and, and so, what are their narratives? Are their narr- narratives pro-China or anti-China? They're the people who've been persecuted by China. These well, yeah, I mean, of, yeah. When there's a check, when there's let, let's just make sure we're aware. There's a check on the table, and all of a sudden they're persecuted by China. That no, may it may or may not be true, but the, let, let's be the, let's be clear yeah, here. There's a check yeah. on the table from the U.S. government. To people, um, they get funding after they're persecuted. They don't get. They don't say take money. Or go, there was. A, I can't remember his name right now. He's quite prominent uh, professor of journalism in in Beijing, and he had written an open letter to the uh, propaganda authorities um, that got released by mistake. He was fired from his job. He lost his job. He was he was under pressure. He was being he was being watched, monitored. Um, NED offered him a um, a fellowship. This was clearly after that. He had no funding from NED prior to that. Um, so um, I, I don't. I don't. They're not. I, I. I don't think there's anything wrong with funding Tibetan groups or Uyghur groups or Southern Mongolian groups. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong with that. So the so the funding the funding with Tibetan groups is actually really relevant because I think uh, history is repeating itself in Xinjiang as far as I'm concerned as far as what I can see. The problem is is like a lot of uh, the U.S. operations aren't declassified until much later. So with Tibet, you're saying you support the funding of these Tibet groups and stuff like that. As long as so in the 60s, as long as sorry, violent. Oh, but they were violent though. I mean, they they were funding which Tibetan group was violent. The ones that were uh, trained in Camp Hale, Colorado, who were armed and then released into Tibet, the campus, the, the the rebels. This is on the this is on the State Department's own website. It's declassified now. What year was that? In the sixties. Yeah, is it happening today? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is you have a certain period of time when these documents become declassified. We didn't learn what happened in my mother's country until like 50 years later, because there's a period of time that these documents become declassified. Granted, they black out some of the areas on the document when they declassify them, but we don't we don't find out about this stuff until after. But we can at least say, so, uh, sorry, uh, when I'm uh, when I'm uh, yeah yeah. So w- w- we can at least say that this is part of the U.S. playbook. When we have the benefit of time behind us, we can see that. They do fund rebel groups. This is they, they do that. I mean, they were funding the moderate rebels into Syria also. We know that they still do this. Years ago with, with the Tibetans, 60 years ago. 
Right, but because he, it's declassified now. The, the, what they're doing right now in Xinjiang is not declassified yet. But we can see and we know they're on record talking about funding moderate rebels to go into Syria who ended up actually being terrorists. So we know that this is a playbook that they continue to use. Obviously, the first time they used it was funding the Mujahideen against the Soviet Union. This is a playbook that's recycled over and over and over again. Right. I mean, I think we can agree on that. Yeah. There's no evidence of any organized resistance within within Xinjiang right now. No evidence of any organized, no group has taken responsibility for anything. Yeah, as I said, those documents won't become declassified until later. There was no evidence of it happening in Tibet either until everything, until the dust settled and we were able to say, wow, the U.S. was actually willing to fund rebel groups. I'm and not- if you look at, so, so, so the thing for me, like, like if you look at, uh, and for me, I see it as an attack from multiple sides, because if you look at even if we look at uh, uh, kind of comparing things and being making sure we're not hypocritical here, when you look at the riots that were happening in Hong Kong and you had Josh Hawley and you had Ted Cruz flying over to cheer on these rioters, these are rioters that were throwing Molotov cocktails, stabbed a police officer in the neck, acid burned another one, lit a man on fire, killed a street cleaner with a brick. They came over to cheer on these protesters and, and, and basically congratulate them for what they were doing. If the same thing happened in reverse and Chinese Communist Party officials from Beijing flew over to the Capitol Hill when those riots and the break and enter was happening, I mean, imagine what would happen. Imagine what would happen. There's a level of interference that the U.S. feels like they can do all around the world that just wouldn't happen in reverse. We haven't seen anything like that. But the only thing I need to I need to establish here is that these kinds of levels of interference, the U.S. does and continually does. I mean, yeah, I don't think the U.S. interfered in Hong Kong. If you if you you don't think the Hong Kong Chinese have the intelligence and the ability and, and the desire to protest themselves. And how many Hong Kong Chinese were seriously hurt or killed by the Hong Kong police? Do you- Zero were killed by the Hong Kong police, oh, zero. No, 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 there was a young girl who got killed. Who? I'll, I'll look it up and I'll send it to you. There was one girl who, who drowned, who, who was suicidal, who drowned, and they found well, her body we, and, they, and, and they tried to blame it on- I think Beijing's argument that she was suicidal. We don't know that. How do you know that? She was found in the. She, I mean, you can't just say you can't find a dead body in the in the ocean and say that the Hong Kong police did it. You can't just say, well, how do we know the Hong Kong police didn't do it? We know that on record there was zero people that the Hong Kong police killed. If you want to have a conspiracy theory about this other person, it's unproven. And even if you want to take that one, in one year of violent riots where uh, where where uh, political offices were being burnt down, people were being stabbed, lit on fire, had acid attacks and stuff like that, one person killed. I mean, you just compare that to the post-George Floyd, Floyd riots and, and, and the fact that even in an ordinary year, the US police kill 1,000 people per year, it's like night and day. Ooh. A lot more people got injured by the police in Hong Kong than you're than you're admitting to. But but let's go back to Xinjiang. Let's go back to Xinjiang. Yeah. Um, my my main thing. My, uh, let me let. So we went down a little bit of a rabbit hole there. The only thing is I'm saying is that. The U.S. oversteps their bounds. The U.S. senator should not have come to Hong okay. Kong to cheer on the rioters. Okay. And so all I'm saying is they have a history of crossing these bounds. Now, exactly what's happening in terms of the funding and stuff like that in Xinjiang, we're not going to know until much later. We can only put the pieces together and see that, oh, they're saying ETIM doesn't exist anymore, even though they were airstriking them in 2018, even though they don't remove other. Now, you've conceded. You said maybe it was political to remove them off of the list just to ruffle feathers or whatever. Um, but when you when you add it all up and you put it all together, I mean, it's like it, it it's it's the same playbook that's being used over and over again. I mean, this, this seems really obvious uh, when you really take a, a high level look at this. I don't. I don't what's that? What's obvious? It's obvious that they want to restore terrorism in Xinjiang. It's oh, obvious that I, as I, soon as ETI, ETIM has been delisted from a terrorist organization, and what it allows them to do is it gives them a- access to U.S. dollars. So, for example, when you put when they put the Tamil Tigers on a terrorist list, if you were caught funding them or anything to you had anything to do with them, you could get yourself in really really big trouble in the in the U.S. Yeah. So ETIM. Maybe it exists, maybe it doesn't just exist from their perspective. But what it does is it gives people a level of security saying that, well, I know they exist and I'm going to donate money yeah. to them now and I'm not going to get in trouble. It, re- it, re- it removes a barrier from people uh, and, and makes it a lot safer for them to continue to fundraise. When you combine that with the sanctions, because they're saying, you know why they're sanctioning Xinjiang, right? They said because there's forced labor accusations, right? Right. Mm-hmm. right? Th- when you look at the underlying documents, there's absolutely zero proof 
that there's forced labor. And some of the companies that were listed on there are, 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 are suing the, uh, suing the uh, think tanks that put those claims out there because it's completely ridiculous. But it's accomplishing what, it, what it's supposed to do. Now, a lot of these contractors who hire Uyghur workers even outside of Xinjiang, they have some of them put in a new policy. They don't hire Uyghurs anymore. And the reason is, is because it's too risky because somebody could come in and film their factory and then there's a Uyghur worker there and automatically they get a forced labor accusation and they don't want that problem on their hands. They're trying to push the Uyghurs back into poverty. I mean, it, 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 when you don't have viable claims to prove your forced labor accusations and you put this on, you're affecting people's lives. You need to have a solid case before you're going to take people's livelihoods away. We've seen how these sanctions, and they've done it in Iraq too, right? They've put sanctions on Iraq and they killed 500,000 Iraqi children. And then, and then Madeline, Madeline Albright gets on, on CBS and they ask her, they say, you killed 500,000 Iraqi children's, with, children with these sanctions. That's more than were killed in Hiroshima. Do you think it's worth it? And she says, oh, it's a tr tough choice, but yeah, we think it was worth it. They're willing to sacrifice ordinary innocent lives to accomplish geopolitical goals. We know this is part of the U.S. playbook, and it's infuriating. So I just want you to know, I'm not getting angry at you. I'm just hoping you understand what drives me and what's making me angry. I'm never going to justify anything the American government does. Um, I, I'll be the first to admit that we have a dark history. I, I was in Vietnam in the Army. I personally saw this. I personally feel I was misled. Um, but what I'm saying is that I have a tremendous, I've been to Xinjiang, I've talked to a lot of people there, I've traveled around Xinjiang, I've spoken to Uyghurs for years in, in, in the U.S. Um, I seriously believe that their rights are being abused, um, that people are suffering, that children are being taken from their parents and put in orphanages, and I think that's wrong. And this has nothing to do with the U.S. government. I don't get any of my information from the, from the U.S. government. I get it from when I traveled there, when I spoke to people, when I spoke to other journalists, when I speak to Uyghur scholars, when I speak to Uyghurs around the world. These are the stories I hear. And I don't think there's any... Yeah and I don't connect it with, with the U.S. government. Also, I, I think this is, yeah, this is, sorry, go ahead. I let, you let me speak, I'll, I'll let you, yeah. Also, just one other thing is that there wasn't so much trouble back in the 90s until China started to tighten the screws in Xinjiang. Once they started to kind of interfere in religion and things, and that's when they started to have uh, terrorist incidents and violence. I think this, when Jiang Zemin was around, when Deng Xiaoping was around, we didn't have these kind of, on, on this kind of level. What, what, what aspects of religion do you think they uh, interfered with during that, that time period? Yeah, it's like I said, you know, no government official, even going down to like school teachers, are allowed to openly practice their religion. Children cannot study, cannot enter mosques. I've been to mosques with their police standing outside. Um, they've, they've torn down mosques. They completely took over the training of the imams. They've, they've, they've cut down on Uyghur language education in schools. Um, it's, they, they don't allow anyone to publish. All sorts of Uyghur poets and novelists, their books are banned. Uyghur singers, their songs are banned. No, no Uyghur books. Uyghur books by people that are not approved by the government. They're independent, okay. they're, you know, uh, scholars, um, writers, yeah, I, I, songwriters. They've all been censored, all been censored. Yeah, I reached, I reached out to, before I went to Xinjiang, I reached out to some of the... Uh, most prolific kind of anti-China voices that focus on Xinjiang. And, and one of the things they told me is I wouldn't find Uyghur books in uh, Xinjiang, especially children's books. And I went to a bookstore and it was filled with Uyghur books. And not only that, they had, um, they had uh, Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger's book was translated into Uyghur. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was all the kids were speaking Uyghur in the streets when the kids were yeah. playing with each other. They're not speaking in Mandarin. They're speaking in Uyghur. Uyghur script is everywhere. I mean, that's why the, the, the thing is, is if we get into these anecdotal stories is because I went to Xinjiang and I didn't see any of that. I have ethnic minority friends there who have issues with the government. They have issues when these measures came in. They felt like they were too heavy handed. It's nothing like what the West is reporting. Mm -hmm. And they, 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 they have some animosity towards the government. But at the end of the day, they're looking at these other measures that are coming in, what the U.S. is doing now, sanctioning them, saying that they're caught in the sanction and stuff like that. And there's, a lot of them are waking up to this saying, hold on a second. This isn't about helping us. First of all, you've blown our story out of proportion. And now you're making us suffer for it. You're making us not be able to sell our own products anymore. Like, what's up with that? I mean, but it, it, again, when you say what what is the possible reason that they would want to take away the livelihood of Uyghurs, there's no way that any of the Uyghur scholars or any of the people involved in these policy decisions don't know that ordinary Uyghurs are going to be affected by a cotton uh, uh, a cotton sanction.
They know that full well. Um, to, to go back to the Uyghur books, of course there are Uyghur books, but they all have to be approved by the government. No book gets published that the government doesn't a- approve. Um, I, I think that's. I, I think there's a level of um, a censorship in China that's true across the board, and it's not right. just in, in Uyghur books, but yeah. it's in, in Chinese books. There's censor. There's censorship in sure. China. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't dispute that. The the only one folk tale that I know uh, that was uh, banned in Xinjiang was an old Uyghur folk tale of uh, I think it was three Uyghur girls who um, didn't want to be captured by the Manchu army, so they threw themselves off of a mountain to mm-hmm. to kill themselves rather than being captured. That is a, a, a an ancient uh, uh, Uyghur tale that is banned. It's a book that's banned, and I don't like that. I don't like that they banned that. I'm trying to imagine why they did that. And what I heard on the surface was some of it was to reduce ethnic tension because there was an ethnic tension issue. Um, and, and, and I understand the hypocrisy of that also because there are, there's an, almost an equivalent story in Mandarin Chinese of Chinese people throw, killing themselves before allowing themselves to be captured by the Japanese. Um, and that, ban- that book's not banned. So I understand the hypocrisy there. I mean, maybe if there was an, a similar issue with Japanese people being attacked in the streets, they would also ban that book. But I understand there's a hypocrisy. It's not perfect. But it's not this, ge- it's not this genocide that's going on that deserves, uh, uh, like, uh, sanctioning these people into poverty. I mean, there are Muslim countries that put restrictions, that, like Egypt to, has to have state-sanctioned imams. Morocco banned the niqab because they were afraid of it being having the Salafist jihadist influence coming in. These things happen all over. These these issues, like banning a Uyghur folktale, is not a good reason to sanction people back into poverty. Yeah, and my argument goes back to, again, I'm not talking about the sanctions or U.S. government. I'm talking about my, I started writing about Xinjiang in 2001. Um, all I've seen is a lot of abuses and persecution, nothing to do with the U.S. government. My own visits to Xinjiang where people were petrified, where I was followed. As soon as I got to my hotel, police came to my hotel, where I was forced to leave, um, where nobody would talk to me. There's a fear there. There's armed soldiers marching on the street with weapons. Um, you can cut the fear with a, with a knife there. And so I'm not talking about sanctions. I'm not talking about the U.S. government. All I'm doing is that I feel that Uyghur people are suffering, and I, I would do the same for any people suffering anyway. I feel the same thing for, for, for minorities in the U.S. You know, I mean, again, if we get into these specifics, because I went, when I went to Xinjiang, there's a heavy police presence. Most of them are Uyghur. There's a heavy, you know, the police are totally integrated I mean, I, I saw them. I saw them with my own eyes. Most of them are Uyghur. At the che- Uyghurs? There were police. Yeah, also, yeah, at the, yes, at the checkpoints also. There were even some of the uh, officers were, at the checkpoints. There, because there, I speak, I speak. There are Uyghur all we- I doubt there yes. are in the PLA. I mean, so th- this is where this is where we're going to get into this uh, uh, thing where it's just that he said, she said, which I'm trying to why I'm trying to uh, keep at high level. But right. even at the checkpoint, the PLA officers, there were some of them that they didn't even speak Mandarin that well. They only spoke Uyghur very well. I, yeah. I speak Mandarin and they were trying they had to get somebody else who spoke better Mandarin over to uh, to speak with me at one of the checkpoints. Yeah. And th- these police officers are fully integrated in, into society there. I saw one pushing somebody in a wheelchair across the road, stopping traffic. And when I was talking to a Uyghur friend there, they said that. Because of what happened, there's a sense of security and safety now that these police are here. Because there were a lot of people who were afraid of these terrorists, rightfully so, now that you know that there were Uyghurs killed by them also. Yeah. And um, she, they even gave me funny antidotes saying that they're so integrated and part of society that even when they have household issues, like she was saying her water pipe burst or something like that, somebody's water pipe burst, and they called the police to come and fix it. And they came and they're like, you're not really supposed to call us for this stuff. And they helped them fix the pipe. But again, this is going to be an issue of me saying what I saw versus you saying what you saw. At the end of the day, inevitably, there was a terrorist issue. What, you know what was interesting for me is I, I managed to, uh, so halfway through my trip, I started reaching out to people and I wanted to, I wanted to find specific people. I wanted to be able to speak to somebody who graduated from the uh, vocational training program. And when I spoke to him, there were a lot of things that made me uncomfortable about the program. I felt like probably there were people that were sent to vocational training that didn't, uh, d- uh, didn't belong there. I don't believe this million number, but 
when you look at the reasons that you go to vocational training center centers, uh, there was one which was a pathway out of jail. If you were in jail for some sort of a, a terrorist related offense, before you get reintroduced in society, you go into these uh, uh, training centers. If you were caught with extremist material on your phone, you go into these uh, uh, centers. Uh, the UK handles it a bit differently. Two months ago, there was a police officer who was caught with banned Nazi material on their phone. There was no re-education. He went straight to prison. Um, so everybody, every place has their uh, own way of dealing with it. But I criticized some of the things, or I talked about some of the things that made me uncomfortable about the program, saying that I, I, it, some of these aspects make me really uncomfortable. And something really interesting happened, because I'm sure you're aware there's 20-something countries that condemned China's treatment of the Uyghurs in uh, Xinjiang. We always hear about that in the media, but they never talk about the 54 countries that said, no, we actually agree with what they're doing and they're actually observing human rights, they're doing all this stuff. And many of those 54 countries were Muslim countries. Something interesting happens when you mention that. People are saying, well, they're corrupt countries. So they care about Muslims until they disagree with them, then all of a sudden they're corrupt people. But on to my point was I got a chance to hear from some of those people after my video, after I criticized some of the things. And they said, you know what? You're off base. You're coming from a privileged society. You're from Canada. And you don't understand when these, this Salafist Jihad ideology spreads through a society, how fast it spreads, how dangerous it is. I had somebody from Iraq saying they wish that they had programs like this in Iraq also. You know, I had Syrians tell me we, they wish they had programs like this in Syria. I mean, there, there was a real, there, was, there were people dying, there was a real issue. Like, what, what would be your solution? Like, what, how would you have fixed it? Because nobody else has managed to fix this. China has decided to fix terrorism within their own borders when they had a terrorism problem. The US, and I know you're not a defender of what the US does, the US decided to fix terrorism that was outside of their borders, and it wasn't with re-education, it was with drone strike that were killing innocent people, that were drone striking weddings and stuff like that. China took a different approach. Nowhere else in history have we had a successful program like this where terrorism was completely eliminated. Probably not without issues, but are you saying that you have a better idea than the Chinese government, even though nobody else has before? What I'm saying is that their measures are overkill, that a lot of people are suffering and people are dying who are innocent. Um, Dokan Issa's mother was 85 years old. Did she need vocational training? Um, I, I can't remember her name now. There's a young woman who's a Uyghur woman who's a medical student at Harvard. Her father was a well-known Uyghur scholar, worked for a, a Chinese publishing company. Uh, he was put in the camp. Did he need training? I've heard a biologist. What's her name? The, uh, there's that other woman. She's a degree in, she's a PhD in anthropology. Why are you putting people with PhDs in vocational training? Why are you putting people in their 80s in vocational training? Do they actually need vocational training? I got to be honest with you. I, I, uh, I've looked into enough of these witness testimonies and so many of them end up being bogus or whole filled like the one I told you about Tursene. I don't believe the witness testimonies. I do think that there probably are a lot of people overseas um, who have family members uh, who legitimately were arrested. Well, I, I shouldn't say legitimately, that they really are, have been arrested. Like, for example, uh, Rushan Abbas, you know, Rushan Abbas, uh, uh, you know, used to uh, uh, work for, work in Guantanamo Bay, uh, ironically, uh, for a military industrial complex company that was also involved in torturing Muslims in Abu Ghraib, also ironically, uh, who works very closely with the U.S. government. Her sister has been detained, and I believe that's true. I believe she really has been detained. I, I, unfortunately, I, there, there's a lack of transparency with some of these things that go on, and sometimes that happens with national security cases elsewhere also. But somebody as high level as that, Rushan Abbas, who was torturing, well, not torturing, mm -hmm. she was around people who were torturing uh, uh, Uyghurs in Guantanamo Bay. She's working with the State Department. She's relentlessly attacking China. I think there's probably a very high likelihood that she was relying on her family also for information from within uh, Xinjiang. I don't have any proof for that. I'm just thinking it's logical that all of a sudden her family would be suspects. I mean, I try to think about the situation in in reverse. If an American was, you know, involved in these kinds of groups overseas and continually because her sister came over to the U.S. multiple times also. Um, I just feel like two things. I, ra I, ra I, I, I wrap it up to two things. One, a lot of them are full of shit just to be honest, like the Tursenay story. And, and if you're, if you're open-minded enough to saying some of these people are full of shit, you'll find a lot of them just like that one. And then the other one is that, yeah, probably there are people who have family members who have been detained for various reasons. Um, 
but there's just really nothing to support these uh, you know, multi, multi-million numbers. I think as soon as you've got people outside of China who left China for whatever reason, for opportunities outside of China, especially when there are so many opportunities available for Uyghurs to join these groups that are funded to the tune of $9 million from the US government, you're going to get a high concentration of people who are opportunists looking to make some sort of a story out of this. We've seen it over and over again. And you, as somebody who was fooled into Vietnam, who was into this, as soon as there's a narrative, a global narrative that's funded even by a dollar by the U.S. State Department, your spidey senses should be tingling and saying, hold on a second, I've been tricked by this BS before because the U.S. government knows how to weaponize compassion and lead us into conflicts on packs of lies. Your default position should be looking for possible issues in the story. And if you did, you would have seen Tersenay's issue also because that's the biggest, most giant one. Yeah. I, I um, when I traveled across, I was in Montreal, Toronto, and St. John's. I pro- I don't know twenty or thirty Uyghurs. Um, they seemed quite sincere to me. They they had no motive for lying uh, at anything. Some of them took a risk that their families could be further hurt by telling this. Um, uh, they were very sincere. I don't think uh, I don't think many of them could have been making this up, and they would have no motive. For making it up, well, I can tell you the I can tell you the motives. So there, there, the NED does operate in Canada with Uyghur groups also. So that's one motive. Uh, the second motive, if you look at the head of the kind of um, uh, what, what's her name, Rabia, Rabia um, oh, shit, I can't remember her name off the top. You, 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 yeah, 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 exactly. When when she talks and you look at her language and mm-hmm. she's saying that we Uyghur people are not like the Chinese, we are closer to white people, we are not yellow, we are the kind of um, uh, uh, purest, you know, ethnic language that she's using. There's a clear desire to want to create divides between groups there, saying that convincing people that you can't live together. Xinjiang has always been a multi-ethnic society. The Mongols have been living there north of the Tianjin Mountains longer than the Uyghurs have. It's always been a multi-ethnic society. But there are a lot of Uyghurs who have been convinced that, no, they need to separate off because they shouldn't be living with people that don't look like them. I've seen this firsthand. That's exactly what I said happened to my mother's country in Guyana. They made the, the people of African descent and Indian descent convinced that they cannot live with each other, that they are enemies. So there is that aspect too. Then the third aspect, there is a religious aspect also, where there are some people who want to establish a caliphate. If you look at what Arslan Hidiat, I don't know if you know Arslan Hidiat, um, uh, he is also a very loud Uyghur voice. When you interact with him and you get and you actually start getting him comfortable, he starts saying his goal is to take over separate Xinjiang into East Turkestan, and after it's separated, to ethnically cleanse the lands, to expel all non-Turkic ethnic minorities from the lands, including the Mongols, who have been there longer than them, because they want to establish a caliphate. Now, he he says once in a while, he says, well, no, we're going to create a democratic society and stuff like that. But there are so many uh, competing interests here in terms of uh, motives. There's There's tons of motives. For people to want to 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 want to do this stuff, from from yeah. my perspective, but I think at the end of the day, if you're going to the two main things, if you're going to sanction, if you're going to sanction people and potentially push them back into poverty, which could potentially reignite um, uh, terrorism, there's a direct link with research saying poverty leaves le- uh, is the environment for extremism, and we're possibly going to. Uh, 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 be pushed into a conflict with China based on human rights abuses, even though uh, this kind of uh, compassion has been weaponized in a similar way to lie to us and lead us into wars before. You need to have home run, solid evidence of forced labor, of a genocide, of all of this stuff. And all we have right now are antidotes. These people who are escaping Xinjiang, they're escaping on their passports through Chinese exit immigrations. They're not producing medical reports of all of the abuses that they, they've uh, they've experienced. The most popular story they're saying now is that they're, uh, they, were, they had a police electric batons put up their various crevices. You'd have second degree burns from that. Nobody's producing anything. They're just coming up with stories, stories after stories after stories. Few Uyghurs have actually. This is a fact. Few Uyghurs have passports. They've been confiscated, so I don't think a lot of oh, them legally. I don't think yeah. a lot. But I wanted to go back to something else. If there's feelings of kind of not identifying with the Chinese, um, there's a lot of reasons for that. The Uyghurs are not Chinese people. They don't speak Chinese. They're not. They were never, um, you know, connected to the Chinese. Their customs are not Chinese. Um, and then if you look at the policies, I went to a department store in Turfan, 
um, brand new department store, very high level, you know, very high end. I talked to a girl on the first floor at one of the cosmetic counters. And I said, um, how many people work here? And she said, about a thousand. I said, because I noticed that these girls, a lot of the girls there were, she was, this girl was from Sutron. I said, how many are Uyghurs? And she said, I think there's one. So the, in, in which area? In Turfan. In Turfan. In the south. In the south, yeah. So, so a, a apartment store opens up. And they have one. And then I went to, there was a KFC connected to the mall. I went in there and um, I was, uh, I saw two young Uyghur girls. There were all the people behind the counter were, were Han Chinese. I could tell by the way they looked. I might have been one or two that, that I, I didn't identify, but they were all Chinese. And um, when I asked one of them, there was a young woman sweeping up the second floor. And I asked her, I said, are there any Uyghurs? Working? And she said, oh, no, they don't want to work with us. And then there were, she walked away. There were two Uyghur girls sitting at the, at the table and they, they kind of said to me quietly, that's not true. They won't hire us. And every place, I went to hotels where the entire staff was Chinese. Um, I, was, I was on a trip. Was my last trip to Xinjiang, uh, I was, the police came to my hotel within 15 minutes. They told me I had to leave. Um, I said I wasn't there on a reporting trip. I was there traveling. And they said, mm -hmm. okay, we're going to be with you. For three, you can stay for three days, but we're staying with you. I had a police officer at my hotel. I could not leave the hotel without him. He stayed with me for breakfast, lunch, dinner, and we even went out for some beers. Uh, the first day or two was a Chinese policeman. The second two, I think the first day was Chinese. Second two days was a Uyghur policeman. Um, the, um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, so I couldn't talk to a single person. Um, couldn't talk to a single person. On the train... That's yeah, sorry. Go ahead. On, on the train, then they, on the third day, they took me, or the fourth day, they took me to the train station, put me in the train, and they stood on the train tracks till they saw the, you know, me waving them goodbye. Uh, I then found uh, two students on the train, Uyghur students who were being educated in Shanghai. They were in a, in a, in a state university. And they said, right. I'm fluent in Putonghua. I'm fluent in Uyghur. I can't get a job in Xinjiang. Nobody will hire me. So the Chinese often argue, oh, they don't speak they don't speak Putonghua, so we can't hire them. But even well-educated Uyghurs have trouble getting jobs in the state system. What, it, what year? What year was that? This was around 2000. I got kicked out in 2012, probably 2011. Um, okay. It might have been 2012. Um, in all my 18 years in China, I never once saw a Uyghur or Tibetan working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of, of uh, Foreign Trade, um, Public Security, but all the con government contacts. I know. You know, I saw, and also I'll give you another excuse, another example. Um, I met a young Uyghur woman in, uh, I forget where it was, in Xinjiang. And then she came to, to, to Beijing about a month later and she contacted me. And I went to see her and she was staying in a hotel that was designated for Uyghurs. Uyghurs couldn't stay in other hotels. They had to stay in designated hotels. Um, I had a Tibetan friend who was doing a degree at Duke University. She came mm -hmm. back in the summer. She couldn't stay in a regular hotel. She had to go into a hotel designated for Tibetan. So if, if there's feelings of like, I'm not Chinese, I think a lot of the blame goes to the Chinese government because they just don't. Yeah. I actually, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna disagree with you there. Back then there was a, there was a serious issue. When Uyghurs traveled, they were checked more than other people. They had their documents checked and things yep. like that uh, uh, during the height of the issues. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna disagree with that. There were serious ethnic tension issues. And it's uh, something I think that they know they needed to, uh, to fix. And based on my visit, because you're saying you didn't see any of these officers or PLA, they were pretty much all Uyghur when I was there. I visited a factory. I bought a bag for my wife that was made in a, in a factory. All, all of them were Uyghur women. Now, one thing was interesting was because before, uh, sorry, when, I'm, when I, I think your, uh, uh, that your speaker, whatever you're using, when I'm speaking, if you're speaking, I don't hear what comes through. Uh, but, but yeah, sorry, I'll just finish. Um, all Uyghur women. But actually, that was a fairly new thing also, because a lot of Uyghur women before didn't really go into the workplace before. They kind of stayed at home. And um, this was something that the government was also trying to encourage. I remember there was a documentary they did where they were trying to convince this girl to go out, learn some skills and stuff like that. And she was crying, but then she went out and then she kind of opened up and she saw the, the world or the country rather. And I know BBC spun that into a negative story. Uh, but some of the, some of the, one of the, uh, my Uyghur friends who's a female in Xinjiang, she said that this uh, opening up of, 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 of factories or places where Uyghur women go to work has been extremely liberating for Uyghur women because when, uh, especially in a family situation, if they were in an abusive relationship, they had very few options. And if they got divorced, 
um, it would be very, very hard for them to get remarried. Now, I think mean, that's true everywhere in China, but specifically in Uyghur culture, it's very, very hard for a Uyghur woman to get remarried. But now she had the ability to provide for herself. And it was this like so many stories of liberation and all of these these things. But what I want to ask then is, all right, so there were ethnic issues before. And actually, I agree with you for Uyghurs traveling. They right. were unfairly treated and profiled and things like that. Isn't this something that should be so there were obviously uh, positive discrimination um, um, uh, policies to try to get, you know, Uyghurs needed less points to get into the top universities and all this kind of stuff. Um, don't you think that is something that they should work towards rather than saying that they should separate Xinjiang off into a separate region? Or like, what's your position on that? Because it sounds like you're leaning towards this. They can't possibly live together kind of thing. I don't think I don't think that a uh, majority of Uyghurs favor any kind of terrorist group, any radical group, any extremist group. I don't think they support it. Uh, I do think they support being treated more fairly, you know, and you mentioned fact everybody, everybody does. Yeah. This, this factory, this women in, in Xinjiang have been working in factory for a long time. This is not something new. But what I'm saying is where are the Uyghur women working for hotels, working for for this, you know, for, um, you know, for restaurants, for working in department stores? You know, you, you don't you know, they're they're excluded from that. Yeah. The hotel I stayed in in Kashgar, all three women behind the desk were Uyghur. All three of them were Uyghur. Uh, I can I can pull it up because I booked the hotel on uh, on on my trip app. Um, so while I'm pulling that up, also in the pharmacies, uh, in the pharmacies, uh, they were a lot of Uyghur women working there. Private. These are probably Uyghur businesses. Uh, potentially, yeah. In the hospital, I I saw a doctor. I had uh, I needed I needed medicine for my back. I screwed up my back uh, before I went there. The doctor I saw was a Uyghur male. Um, his yeah. wife was working uh, in the hospital as a nurse uh, who was also Uyghur. I'm, I'm talking about in, in the, on the commercial side. I'm talking about in, in Chinese companies. There are almost no Uyghurs uh, unless it's a factory. Or, or some kind well, of the, the factory, the bag factory that I, yeah, the bag factory I visited was uh, was uh, was Chinese owned. Um, the uh, the pharmacies, we can we can only guess, right? We can only guess um, uh, what it was, but um, but there, I mean, the point is, there. Regardless, they're integrated into society. People are are, I are you, disagree with that completely. Disagree. I mean, all, all them being all I, I think things have gotten worse since I left. They haven't gotten better. I think it. I mean, it, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm listening to your stories of what you saw when you were there, and all I can do is take your word for it. And I also agree with some of the stuff you're saying. But no matter what I say to you, it seems like you're not going to believe me that there's PLA officers who are who are Uyghur and all this stuff. I mean, I, th this stuff. Yeah, I, I've seen I've seen Uyghur police officers. I and again, I don't know about the PLA. I've never visited a PLA camp. What I'm saying is that when I saw these um, kind of SWAT teams on the streets in Urumqi and in Kashgar and Hotan, uh, they were obviously Chinese, not, not Uyghurs. So I'm not yeah. saying Uyghurs in so the, the Yeah, the hotel, the hotel I stayed in was uh, Qin, uh, Qinbag Hotel, Q-I-N-I-B-A-G-H Hotel. It's not too far from ancient city. All, all Uyghur staff. They did. That's a Uyghur hotel. Um, but I stayed in a five, one of the, I think it was the only four-star hotel. It's right next to the Mao statue in Kashgar, and there wasn't a single... Um, okay, so what, what, what's your so, so let, let's say Uyghur hotels, all Uyghur workers, Chinese hotels, no. all Chinese uh, workers. What's nope. your what, 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 what's your solution? My solution is that you give them a, a fair chance that you that you um, that that all that these people be hired, that they not be relegated. They're just working in factories. Um, um, and well, that, no, they're, they're working. They're working in hotels also hotels that are Uyghur owned. The problem is, it seems like as far as your what you can see is there's a level of segregation and it goes both ways. Uyghur businesses have Uyghur workers. Uh, uh, Chinese businesses, Han Chinese businesses have Han Chinese workers. It goes both ways. So, I mean, when you say fair chance, are you saying that they should have some sort of programs together to mix and become but, more but, harmonious? Like, what, what's the solution? What I'm saying is whether it's political or, or racial. There's a there's a, um, a a trend or a policy in Xinjiang that Chinese companies do not hire Uyghurs, and they'll often say it's because they don't speak Putonghua. This is uh, uh, so. So would you say that uh, Uyghur businesses who focus on Uyghur clientele, it's the same thing? They don't hire Han Chinese because they don't speak Uyghur. Uh, that would be it. I also think because they also have a bias against the Chinese. The Chinese are not liked.
in Xinjiang, which is an indication. So the Chinese, so the, for, from your perspective, the Chinese, Han Chinese don't like uh, Uyghur Chinese, mm -hmm. Uyghur Chinese right. don't like Han Chinese. Yeah. So, well, I mean, so, I mean, I can tell you, for example, like uh, one of the measures that the, the, the government took was after the Urumqi attacks, the government used their censorship mechanisms. Um, I can't remember how it was a couple of years after there was something like that to ban and remove all things that were is, uh, overly Islamophobic or insulting towards Islam. They put these measures in place to try to prevent, to try to bring down these kinds of uh, ethnic tensions and things like that. I mean, I, uh, I think that was yeah. the excuse for doing it. I think they also censored a lot of things that were not extremist or a threat. Anything that was like about Islam, they wanted to censor. No, no, they weren't. They weren't censoring Islam. They were censoring Islamophobic content, things that yeah. were insulting towards Islam. That's their interpretation. Who decides what's Islamophobic? Who decides what's extremist? The Chinese government, the Communist Party. And I'm saying we can't accept no more than I would accept. Expect you to accept some American explanation for things. I, I wouldn't accept the CCP explanation for things. I think they labeled these things. That if, you know, when I was just reading these books by Bovingdon and, and, and Roberts and um, another guy, what's his Nick Codswell or something, they basically give examples that it was kind of the Chinese blocked a lot of things that weren't extremists, weren't jihadists, were not um, causing any problems. It was just that we want to discourage ident identification with Islam. I mean, I, I, the, the, if the default position is that just no matter what efforts the go uh, Chinese government makes, you're not going to even consider that it's possible that they were trying to reduce ethnic tensions this way or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it's when I listen to somebody from the West, I'm not automatically saying, well, I'm not going to listen to what you say. I also don't automatically listen to what the Chinese government says. So let's back away from that. If you think that they didn't no. do that, we have this issue of segregation. Right. What, what is your solution? First of all, I don't think they should have flooded Xinjiang with so many Han Chinese. Uh, the, the, the segment of the, the Chinese segment from 1949 until... So your solution is more segregation. No, I'm just saying, why take over the province? Why take all the jobs? Why just... Well, they went to the north. Most, most Han Chinese went to the north. The south yeah. is still majority Uyghur. The, the, most of the Han Chinese went to the north, which was where most Han Chinese were already. But mm -hmm. this has been for centuries a multi-ethnic society with, uh, with, with Uyghurs, with Mongols, with Han, with everybody. So it's a multi-ethnic society. And the only solution I've got from you for, so far is that while they shouldn't move people in or they shouldn't like, are you like pro-segregation, yeah. ethnic no. purity kind of a... What I'm saying is that the Chinese government has done a lot of things that promoted divisions between Chinese and, and Han. That's what I'm, uh, and, and Uyghurs. What, what would be like um, uh, an example of that? Oh, I think a lot of the propaganda, the exaggeration of tourist incidents. Um, I think, you know, the, you know, the, the, the cultural crackdown, um, you know, they, those terrorists, those they, terrorist incidents, they, we, they were censored in China. The first time they ever released the footage of those terrorist attacks was in a CGTN documentary last year. Nobody, nobody had seen a lot of those terrorist attacks in, in China. That was the first time they released it to the public because everybody, everybody was saying so many of those attacks, everybody was saying it's a fake thing. There isn't really terrorism. And they're like, OK, we're going to do a documentary. It was an English language documentary and they put it out to the world. Right. Uh, I mean, they really don't know anyone who denies that there are terrorist incidents. In, in I mean, there, there were a lot, there were a lot of people that were downplaying it. But now anybody. So again, anybody, sorry. Anybody that's a, a, a prominent expert? Yeah, there's uh, yeah, there's um, Bethany um, Bethany a Abraham. Um, uh, I don't. I, I can't remember. Her. She yeah. she she's she's one of the scholars that's regularly. Um, she speaks Chinese also. When she was talking about the um, the Kunming train attack, she was really dismissive about it. And also when she translated um, infidel from uh, from Chinese into English, she didn't use the word infidel. She was basically whitewashing them mm -hmm. uh, the whole time. There was so much whitewashing of the terrorist attacks that went on. And again, I think people need to understand it was Uyghurs who were being attacked by these groups also, you know, which goes to show. I say yeah. There's very few incidents of attacks on civilians. The vast majority of the, of the attacks have been on police or military or government. There's very few incidents of actual terrorist attacks against 
even Han civilians uh, are, 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 are Uyghurs. So I think oh, there were there were I mean, there was uh, what was it uh, 800 killed in a period of uh, I can't remember the period of time. A lot of them were civilians and a lot of them were Uyghurs. But you're right. I mean, especially if uh, they were Uyghur police officers um, or Uyghur people working for the government, they were specifically targeted by these groups. Uh, they were sought out um, because, again, they were these groups that were uh, had a. a it was a mix of both a religious ideology and an ethnic purity ideology that these people shouldn't be be mixed together. But again, it just goes back to like, there was a serious issue and you're saying you never downplayed it, but nobody else has been, has managed to solve this issue in a reasonable way. Um, so, uh, so what, what, what is, what, what should they, what, what should they there, done? There's evidence of more acts of terrorism in other provinces of China, and the government doesn't put in mass numbers of people in prison. It doesn't uh, clamp down. Doesn't uh, intimidate and harass people. There are inc- there are many incidents of these types of things. A guy went into a school someplace in on way with, with with dynamite and blew up the school and killed forty students and a couple teachers. Yeah. Uh, so so who, what 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 who who would be targeted for like what what this what was uh, did you read the reason why he did that? Nobody, he, he died in the explosion. Yeah. So if all of a sudden when he, we, they found a suicide note and said that he belonged to a specific cult and that's why he did it, I can guarantee you that everybody from that cult would be on a watch list and target it. I think they would do exactly the same thing. No, but there, I, I know there were terrorist incidents all over China um, and that um, we don't see this kind of reaction. I, I, I personally, and, and you can disagree with me, I personally think that the situation has gotten far worse in the, in, since 2001, and even since even since I left in 2012. Um, and I think this is the cause for a lot of the, the trouble today. Um, they've alienated a lot of the Uyghurs, and um, and I think it's overkill. I don't think I, I don't think there have been that many um, terrorist incidents in Xinjiang that would justify the policies. And I and I don't I can't say there's a million people in camps, but I firmly believe that there are a lot of people in camps because I've spoken to people who are relatives who were in the camps um, and they didn't lie to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, the BBC, the BBC covered the, the uh, vocational training centers also. They went in and they filmed it um, and they showed that these are pe- they go home on the weekends. They even showed the bus that left on the, if, you if know. This, this is one of the prison camps. BBC would have not gotten anywhere near it. So you can say, yeah, they took them in. There are vocational centers, but that doesn't mean there are in prisons. And I don't know of a single journalist who's gotten into any of the prisons actually. Did you, did well, there, there, there was, there was, uh, there was a, uh, what was it? I can tell you right now. Just uh, three weeks ago, one of them visited the detention center. Um, it was, I, I can't remember the news outlet, but they went into a detention center also. Um, and, and this is the problem. Like people need to be coming to the to this to the table with a level of honesty. Also, I mean, you look at Vladimir Voronkov when he visited Xinjiang from the perspective of seeing, okay, what did China do in terms of their uh, counterterrorism measures? He was blasted for even looking at it from a, a lens of legitimacy. Was that he? okay? The, 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 Vladimir Voronkov, he's the UN uh, uh, chief of counterterrorism, mm-hmm. and. Um, and uh, he thought what what was done was a pretty um, robust and a meaningful program, and nobody wanted to listen to him because people are coming in and they only want to find one thing, and mm-hmm. that's why I'm saying. I mean, uh, we we you undoubtedly. I mean, you must be able to see this. There's a, basically a cold war going on between the U.S. and China. Whether you want to go with, uh, use language as strong as cold yeah. war, there's a propaganda war. There's a battle. The U.S. doesn't want to see China overtake the U.S. I mean, that's. Uh, that, yeah, that may be. Um, there's definitely a Cold War. I don't doubt that. But I'm saying is that has nothing to do with what's happening with Chinese policy in Xinjiang. Yeah, I mean, but, but, but when we drill down to like what you saw and what I saw, there's a, a, a either there's been an evolution of what's happened in Xinjiang or one of us are lying mm-hmm. in terms of anybody else who would be who would be watching. I, I don't think but it's but maybe we have different interpretations of what's happening. I know I'm not. Yeah, lying. I mean, it, so yeah. I, you know, I mean, would you would you would you agree, though, that what I said about before sanctioning a people's it would potentially back into poverty, there needs to be some pretty overwhelming evidence? Um, I, I don't know enough about the sanctioning issues or how it's affected people. So I won't comment. I won't I won't say you're wrong. Right. I don't know. 
um, makes sense to me. Um, but what I'm saying is that I think the Chinese government has been ham-fisted in dealing with the Uyghurs. And, and I know this from base, from many, many conversations I've I've had. Okay. With well, let, 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 let's hone in. Let's hone in on the, the, the genocide aspect, because um, I went and nobody I didn't get any pr prior approval. I didn't tell anybody when I was going. I went outside of the mosques and saw people going into the mosques. Yeah. There were people going in to pray. Most of them were old um and on uh but more more people it was more vibrant on fridays when you know there was a variety of ages coming or at the end of holidays then you get a lot more people coming right. and i asked the uh imam uh it, you know about the the visitor levels and stuff like that mm -hmm. and of course you could just say he's a, a mouthpiece for the ccp and lying to me uh, but he did tell me he said the numbers are down and i asked him i said well is that are there any measures in place to try to uh, discourage people from coming and he said no that's just a natural phenomena everywhere in world with religions is when uh, a society uh, becomes more prosperous people come less often but he says at the end of holidays or, or special events there's still a lot of people that come um, like I said, the kids, if, if ever since the time that you were here in whatever it was, 2012, 2013, they were trying to eradicate the Uyghur language, I shouldn't have been hearing kids like five, six year old kids in the street yeah, speaking Uyghur about, with each. Yeah, I'm, I, that, that will take years to happen, but I think it's going to happen. I'm talking about in the schools, in universities. Um, yeah, with, I mean, they weren't born. They weren't born when you were here. And there's still the kids here are in the street speaking Uyghur with each other from Uyghur families. But I'm saying in the schools. Um, you're going to have kids who can't read or write Uyghur if they're not being taught it in the schools, you know. But they, they are they are being they are being taught it in the schools, though. Not 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 across the board. And I know universities years ago eliminated Uyghur as a language in the universities, except for Uyghur as a as a second language or a foreign language. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that, to be honest, I'm not going to comment on that. I'm not sure. I mean, if they were doing some sort of a specialty in business or engineering or something like that, it makes sense to do it in the <laughs> national language. But yeah. For you, but um, definitely in universities have stopped teaching uh, in Uyghur, and then in, in lower levels, high schools and middle schools. Yeah, I think there's also. I mean, <clears throat> you know, the, the thing the thing too is though is that we always can. There's a there's got to be a threshold where we are continually hearing over and over again that China is eliminating Tibetan culture, China is eliminating this culture, but then when you actually look at it, when you look at the Kyrgyz people in China they still speak their language and the people in Kyrgyzstan don't even speak it anymore. The young people are only speaking Russian. Mm -hmm. You look at an inner Mongolia, they're still using the original Mongolian script. They're not even using it in Mongolia. You look at the Kazakh people, they're more proficient in their la Kazakh language than the people in Kazakhstan. The, in Tibet, these people have more Tibetan culture than the people who are living in these uh, communities in India and in these Tibetan communities in India. At some point, you got to say China's been really bad at eliminating these cultures. I mean, because you, you took this approach saying, wait and see. We've done that so many times, especially for Tibetan culture being eradicated. I mean, I don't know if you've been to Tibet. I've been twice. I, I hiked around Kailash Mountain and it's like none, none of this stuff is happening. I applied seven times to visit Tibet. I was turned down each time. When was that? What year was that? From between 1994 and 2012. Journalists, it's very difficult for journalists to get oh, a okay. visit to Tibet. I'm a journalist. I had a journalist visa the whole 18 years I was there. Um, the, uh, they allow people to come in on visits occasionally, once every two or three years, and then they're closely guarded and, and, and watched and not allowed to leave on the, the hotel on their own. Um, occasionally, an individual journalist will get, but I applied about seven times. I got turned down every time. Um, and every time I've gone to Xinjiang, I've been, I've been, I've been followed. Um, so I just think if things are so great in Tibet and Xinjiang, why are they, I mean, I'd love to talk to people and have Uyghurs tell me, oh, everything's fine, but I, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I understand the context of, uh, of Tibet. Um, I, now I did go, I did go about five years ago and I hiked around Kailash Mountain by myself. Um, I was with a Tibetan guy for uh, part, of the, part of the journey. Um, and uh, they were doing, everybody was doing their spiritual core around it, you know, where they do the thing where they go on the ground and they push themselves and they get back up. Um, and I mean, yeah, it, it, this is the thing, like, you know, the, the, the U.S. does this stuff. Like, I know it was back in the 60s. They train rebels, they drop them into Tibet, and then all of a sudden there's controls in Tibet, freedom of movement is affected and all this stuff. And people are like, why are you not more open? And you look at the new RAND report that came out, the, the, the report from RAND Corporation, which is funded by the U.S. State Department, talking about a war with China. And they were talking about ramping up aggressions 
against China, so much so that the Chinese have to become more repressive and put more controls and more censorship in place so that their people are discontent and they have uh, discontent uh, arising within the government. This is a, uh, this was uh, published not too long ago from Rand. So, and report. Uh, Rand report said we want to ramp up this type of talk so that we'll, we'll cre create dissent and, and anger and, and, and society kind of disintegrates. That's right. what, what's that? Right, yeah, yeah. To, to create uh, more repression and basically, so. yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's what they're, they're, the guy who's on uh, Biden's staff right now even said that about, um, shoot, what was his name? It's right on the tip of my tongue. Uh, he wrote a book on sanctions. And then when he was, when he was talking about Iran, he said it was to re uh, pump up unemployment and make the situation a little bit more sticky there. Mm -hmm. I mean, the sanctions are put on countries to impoverish and kill ordinary people so that they become discontent and rise up against their government. So when China's dealing with this kind of stuff, this continual threat against them, I don't think it should be too much of a surprise that there are so many controls in place. I mean, during World War I and World War II, every world war, when these wars happen, democratic freedoms are also, a, a lot of democratic freedoms are suspended in the West as well. Well, China has been under constant attack. I kind of understand the perspective of them saying, you're literally trying to kill us. And you just you're you're asking us now, why aren't you just open? I mean, to me, that that's the ridiculous thing. I mean, it, it, I disagree with you on your interpretation of this. I mean, I think the U.S. pumps a lot of money into education in China. We take 50, 60, 70,000 grad students every year. I, I don't think the U.S. has a policy of completely destroying. And when I was in when I was in, in, in China, I saw quite a few programs that were exchange programs that were uh, environmental issues, uh, social issues. The U.S. government spends a lot of money. Yeah. I, US yeah, the U.S. government spends a lot of money on, and they've even admitted this directly, weaponizing human rights causes, whether it be weaponizing women's rights and things like that for the purposes I, of uh, inf infiltrate. They've admitted this directly. I've never seen any talk of weaponizing human rights. I've never seen that. Yeah, that, that is a common thing they do. I mean, even, even the Hong Kong example, that was completely off base to have senators come over and cheer on uh, 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 protesters like this. I mean, they... they, they it, 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 can, it couldn't be any more clear as day that China is under attack. Um, ever since the 60s, when rebels were being armed and airdropped into Tibet uh, to now, it has never yeah. stopped. This, I'm, so, I'm just, not 1950 or 1960. I don't think the things that you're... Right, uh, th th this just goes to show how long it's been going on for. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and 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 the evidence, though, of any, any of that happened. If, you know, and back in the 50s, you had actual Tibetan you know, kind of uh, free, with freedom fighters crossing the border and going into China and battling with the PLA. Having yeah, funded and armed by the U.S. Yeah, but that hasn't, that was back in the 60s. It hasn't done yeah. that. Well, okay, let me, let me put it this way. Let me put it this way. How, let's say the leader of, uh, one of the leaders of the, of the Capitol Hill riots when they broke into Capitol Hill and stuff like that. What, what would you say if one of those guys flew over to Beijing to testify in front of the National People's Congress and talk about how they can bring down America, how they can sanction America, how they can do all of this stuff, and then flew back. And then, and then while they're doing this rioting and stuff like that, Chinese Communist Party officials flew over to Washington, D.C. to cheer on these uh, rioters. I mean, how outrageous or how off base, how much of a violation, how much of a declaration of war even, I'll go as far as saying, do you think, do you think actions like that would be? I, I think I think it's wrong on both sides, but yeah, I, but it's only happening one way. It's only happening one way. But I don't think it has any impact. I don't think that Ted Cruz or, or Holy had any impact, or that the U.S. is feeling this. The, I lived in Hong Kong for five years. I know a lot of Hong Kong journalists, academics. Um, I was just there two years ago. Um, the vast majority yeah, of would... people are not happy. China promised fifty years of autonomy. We don't have it. Uh, China's completely taken over everything. People in Hong Kong, no. they don't need Ted Cruz um, to tell them. And it's, yeah. it's kind of uh, kind of an insult to people in Hong Kong to assume that they don't have the intelligence to think. No, it's an, ins it's, a, it's an insult to the people of Hong Kong to be siding with these people who are propped up by the U.S. I'm a Hong Kong ID card holder. I was just in Hong Kong uh, uh, three days uh, uh, or uh, one week ago. And what's that? Who's propped up by the U.S.? The protesters were propped up by the U.S. In what way? The um, uh, what do you call him? Um, Joshua Wong literally flew over to Washington, D.C. to testify in front of the uh, the the summer of discontent and talk about ways that they could sanction and bring down China. That they also they I don't 
for him talking about Benny Ty, Benny Ty, Benny Ty, the organizer of the Umbrella Movement, was 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 funded in the uh, uh, university department that was receiving funds not from the NED, the other one, the uh, it's another uh, U.S. government uh, NGO. Uh, they're all over this. The U.S. is. I mean, they've even admitted it themselves. No, Benny Ty, he's a well respected scholar. Yeah, and he and he was and the university department he was working with was funded by U.S. NGOs. It's Chinese university. Yeah, and and all of these have funding coming in from U.S. U.S. government so, bodies. So if a, if an NGO funds a university in Hong Kong, it's subversive. If a university uh, it, it funds people like Benny Tai, who go then off to uh, uh, to to host pro protests, or they have they're training people like Joshua Wong or working alongside him, this is absolutely a hundred percent sedition. No, no, you have to prove there's some some link that they're told or they're being educated. Just because they provide money to a university for academic reasons doesn't mean. Uh, that you the Oslo Freedom Forum were training the Hong Kong rioters. Huh? The Oslo Freedom Forum were literally training the Hong Kong rioters. They were coaching Joshua Wong on what to do. They were, and and also on a live stream with um uh, uh what's his name uh, Steve Bannon and Guo Wenwei. They were literally on calls directing crowds of, and this was on his own live stream on his YouTube channel, directing crowds um, during the Hong Kong protest. And they also got um, uh, Baguio Liang. They, he told Baguio Liang directly, uh, the leader of the National Front Party, that he would get all of the support he needed from the U.S. government. They're going to get visas ready for him and everything like that. And two months after that, his party, his party members were arrested in the largest explosives hall in Hong Kong history. I mean, this is this has got it's completely sedition. He Bannon's a complete moron. He doesn't represent. He, he doesn't work for the U.S. government. Um, I, I just think it's you're you're underestimating the intelligence of the Hong Kong people. They're quite well educated. Um, they don't like what's happening. They're opposing it. You can't, you can't justify everything by saying that there's some boogeyman behind the Tibetans, the Uyghurs. There's, there are a lot of- do you, know what, do you know what happened? Do you know what happened to ordinary Hong Kong people who spoke out against the rioters? I'm talking about Hong Kong born and raised people. Did you see the videos of what happened to them? No. They got smashed, women also. Women were smashed in the face. They were beaten up. A ho the, the construction worker who was lit on fire, he was a Hong Kong born and raised man. The Did construction you, worker that was bricked to death, he was, he was a Hong Kong man. I don't know about these things. Did you see the video of the, of the, of the gangs in the, in, the, in the MTR beating up? Yes, yeah. The police yeah, yeah, that was wrong. Not, the police did nothing. They were standing feet away. You can see them in the video, and they did uh, there, there's, a, there's a video I can share with you about that that shows the timeline uh, very clearly about what happened. And also, that was very creatively cut out because what they did was they cut out the parts where the protesters started th uh, throwing fire hydrants and, and, um, and uh, weapons at the... Yeah, you, you didn't see... Fire hydrants or extinguishers? Uh, sorry, sorry fire, fire, fire extinguishers um, at the white shirts, because what the white shirts were doing was they were blocking the MTR exits. And that was wrong. They shouldn't have done that. But they were blocking the MTR exits because they didn't want them to protest in Hong Kong, uh, in, in, in Yenlong, in so Yenlong district. You send in the police. You don't send in triads. You don't send in gangs. They didn't send. They didn't send. They didn't send. They didn't send in the triads. The, the triads have been arrested now. Pe I, those people are doing jail time now. Gangsters, they weren't police. You send in uniform police. You don't send and in. They've been arrested. Or, some, they, they've been arrested and charged. A bunch of them have been arrested and charged. They shouldn't have done that. It was wrong. The, the police, but but uh, anyways, I mean, the, the point is, is, you know what? When I went to Yenlong, because I, 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 uh, uh, one of my good friends lives in Yenlong. Actually, I visited him just last week also. When that happened, I told him, because I didn't like what the white shirts did also. I told him and his, some of his older family was around. I said to him, I said, you know, be careful because apparently the white shirts are going to come out again because the protesters said they're going to come back. And he said, uh, yeah, I know. We support the white shirts. Like they were so fed up of the protesters and nobody could speak up against them. This was the first group of people that was standing up against them. Still wrong. But when I posted my videos in Hong Kong, because that's when I started vlogging, I had so many people, people who hadn't contacted me for years from when my son was going to school in Hong Kong, um, his classmates' parents reached out to me and said, thank you so much for making these videos. We cannot say anything in Hong Kong. If we say something, these rioters are going to come after us. I mean, the fact that you don't know that this man was lit on fire, the fact that you don't know that they killed a, a street cleaner with a brick goes to show how well this narrative was controlled. These things happened. You don't, you don't think that there are many, many Hong Chinese Hong Kong, equal to the number that you're citing or maybe far more who support the protests, who are against? Oh, yeah, there are. There are. 
Yeah, yeah I would get. I, I would get. I mean, if you took a, a superficial view at um, what the elections mean, if you if you the last district elections, if you look at, if you just and this isn't really a, a scientific way of doing it, but if you say the percentage of people that voted for pro-democracy parties versus uh, pro-establishment parties. 57% of people voted for pro-democracy parties. That doesn't necessarily mean they supported the protesters, especially because the cutoff date for the, pro, uh, for the uh, district elections were before the real violence started, but whatever. So maybe 55, 45 or something like that. Yeah, there were people that support the, 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 the protests. But the fact <laughs> that you didn't know about that massive portion of the population, you didn't know about the people that the rioters killed and lit on fire, goes to show you how easy it is to control these narratives. So yeah. now you haven't been to Xinjiang for a while. Yeah. You're, you're viewing it from the outside. Yeah. You're underestimating the power of this propaganda that's going on that's telling you that it even got worse since you were here and not better. Basing it on scholars, I'm basing on fellow journalists that I know who've managed to get in there and who've reported on it. Or reporters, yeah. yeah my, Those, I don't, that, that we, we, were, we were relying on the reporters in Hong Kong also, and you don't know about any of this stuff. That's the problem. We were no, also relying on the... We, not, we, let, let me tell you. A lot we, of stuff in Hong Kong, I don't remember every single thing that happened in Hong Kong. It's Maybe not I, just you. I'm telling you. I'm not, I'm not criticizing yeah. you for not knowing that. Nobody knows it. In the West, nobody knows about this stuff. Everybody who is cheering for the Hong Kong protesters and stuff like that, when you confront them with this information, and they were relying on human rights activists, they were relying on people like Joshua Wong, Benny Tai, Denise Ho, all of these people saying we're being persecuted in Hong Kong. They were relying on the BBC. They were relying on CNN. They were relying on all these outlets. And nobody knew the truth. Nobody knew how divided it was and how people were suffering who, who disagree with the protesters. So what I'm saying is if you take that realization that they managed to control that narrative so well, even with all of the things that you're relying on for Xinjiang also, you've got the journalists, you've got the human rights activists, you've got and the Uyghurs. people saying, oh, we need freedom. Uyghurs, Uyghur people. Uyghurs also. Yeah, you had Hong Kong people also. You had many Hong Kong people speaking up also. And that portion of the story was completely left out. It, was, it, it managed to be censored so well. Now you can imagine if that managed to slip past you, and it's not just you, a lot of people, the same thing is going on in Xinjiang because Xinjiang did not get worse since then. And it's not as it's being how depicted. Do you, how do you know it didn't get worse? I mean, I can see, I can see what's going on now. I, I, I talk to ordinary people. I, I know, I know, I know the difficult period of time. It, it, and I, and you, when was the first time you went to Xinjiang? The first time was um, that, that was so, so I I have most of my friends from Xinjiang I know in in Shenzhen for many many years but the time I went to Xinjiang was uh, what was it it was about six months ago first time yeah so how can you say things haven't gone worse when you weren't there because eight? because I was I I have friends from Xinjiang who told me how bad it was before when they were traveling and they were racially profiled by police officers in airports. And they had problems checking into certain hotels. I know those things existed. I, I know what you're saying in that regard is completely true. Well, I have Uyghur friends too. And, and the description and what I've been reading, what Uyghurs are saying when they've escaped China, um, and they're saying it's, it's worse. And I can see by the government policies, the new religion law, a lot of these things that are just tightening up and the restrictions. Um, which, which specific religion law are you, uh, do, you know, do you know the specifics yeah, of it? They have a, what was it called? I have to look it up. There was a, a, a new, a, a kind of a, um, a revision of the law and religion uh, that, that tightened up things. I can find it. I can email it to you. I was just yeah. Saying. I mean, this, this, this happens in Muslim countries as well. I mean, even Egypt, it's the same kind of a thing. Uh, in Egypt, uh, the imams have to be approved by the state. Uh, they, they shut down Salafist jihad uh, kind of ideology, uh, uh, Salafist kind of mosques and things like that. Uh, they're, they're, these, con these kinds of controls happen across the entire well, Muslim world. I know that mosques have been torn down. I know that children S aren't allowed to in, into the mosques. I know that, um, that, that nobody, even students under 18 can't go into a mosque. I know that university students have been kicked out for praying or having some kind of religious, um, um, you know, kind of practice. Um, so to me, no, you're not, you don't know about this and, you know, you haven't heard about it, but, but I have. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, you yeah, know, I mean, I've, I've a multiple, I've got musing. So, um, but anyway, we, yeah, we I mean, a uh, whole day about this. Uh, um, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think at, at the end of the day, um, so you think there's a, a cultural genocide going on where religious freedoms are being, uh, clamped down on the language is being, uh, clamped down on, but there's no evidence of, yeah, 
Yeah, and but there's no evidence of that uh, their uh, Uyghur ability being deteriorated. They and it's worth mentioning they use the same narrative against uh, Tibet also. Um, the first time I went to Tibet, I went on my own. The second time I went as an organized group and I went into a school and I actually put one of the Tibetan girls on the spot. Uh, she explained one of her science experiments in uh, Mandarin and I didn't tell anybody I was going to do this beforehand. I said, now tell now explain it to me in Tibetan. And she explained the whole experiment to me in Tibetan as well. Yeah. Um, and that's a narrative they used against Tibet also decades ago, saying the language, the culture is being eradicated and it's not just happening. I, so, I, I visited Tibet yeah, we, in Xinjiang. I'm sorry, in um, in in uh, Yunnan province, and uh, yeah. they had and these are purely Tibetan areas, and they had stopped Uyghur, um, Tibetan language learning. And I went to schools that were set up by monks specifically to train the kids in Tibetan because the public schools didn't have it as a language anymore. And there were kids there who couldn't who couldn't younger kids who couldn't speak Tibetan anymore because they weren't learning it in school. You know, that, um, was in, that was in in, in Sichuan on the. Huh? That was in the Sichuan province, or no, in Yunnan province, in the Zhongdian. Oh, Yunnan. Oh, Yunnan. Okay. Yunnan. Yeah. Area. Um. Yeah. My. I have friends who live in uh, Shangri La, and yeah, they. About yeah. Yeah. Their kids. Their. Their. Their kids. Uh. Their Tibetan is better than their better than their Mandarin. That's for sure. Uh. When I communicate with them, um. But again, like there's no if you if you look at whatever. So decades ago, they say that uh, Tibetan culture is being eradicated. The language is being eradicated. And there's no real evidence that that really ever took place. We can take the claims against Xinjiang with a grain of salt until we actually see it turning out that all of a sudden Uyghurs can't speak their language anymore. I don't think that's going to happen, but w we can wait for that. I yeah. think less of a problem in Tibet. I think the Chinese government is far more concerned about the Uyghurs because they're Muslim. And if you're Muslim, then you must be a terrorist. So I think that in, in Tibet, they've been far, uh, done far fewer things to discourage, you know, to try why, to... Why are, they not, why are they not going after the Hui Muslims then? Because the Hui Muslims don't have, a, um, they don't have any kind of um, uh, their own territory. They don't have their own province. They're not, the Chinese don't see them as being kind of separatists or trying to have independence. Okay, so, so it's, about, it's, about, it's about separatism, not about religion. I, yeah, I think. Well, I think it's religion in that is that the Chinese government sees it as part of separatism. Well, I mean, it can, they, 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 if 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 Islam in general uh, equates to separatism, then everybody who's a part of Islam would be equated with that. I mean, it, it sounds like it sounds like it's specific to separatism. It's well specific to Xinjiang and and the people that are being told they can't wear dopas, they can't have beards, they can't wear veils. Um, they, they can't, someone can't go to a mosque. Um, how, how yeah, well, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, because uh, one of the things that I heard was when these uh, uh, Salafists were, these jihadists were trying to get Uyghurs to live according to their interpretation of Islam, forcing Uyghur women to wear niqabs was one of the things that they were doing. And that's actually not a part of Uyghur culture. Niqabs are not a part of, of traditional Uyghur culture. So to me, it was like that was the cultural genocide going on, forcing these things onto them. So the Chinese government came in and said, no, niqabs are banned. Now, obviously, other countries have banned niqabs also. Um, even Muslim countries, 99% Muslim country Morocco, banned the manufacturing um, of, of, of niqabs locally because they also felt it was a, a, a Salafist ideology uh, linked to the groups that were responsible for terrorist attacks I, in Northern Africa. I don't know other that. countries... I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, I, I mean, other countries do this as well. Like, the, the, all of these things you're talking about with uh, in regards to that are not enough of a reason to sanction uh to, to sanction xinjiang yeah i i'm you then you keep mentioning the sanctions i'm not i'm talking about what is the chinese government doing and i don't know of any jihadist groups that existed in xinjiang that, that were able to influence women um but what i'm saying is that i know a lot of women want to wear veils i know a lot of men want to wear a dopa i know a lot of men who want to have beards and they're being told they can't do it and um and they don't do this with the way muslims the way Muslims don't suffer any. So what's the justification? And there's no connection so, between terrorism and wearing a beard. You know, it's they're trying to discourage anything, uh, you know, a religious culture in, in, uh, among the Uyghurs. 
Well, yeah, I mean, I think there were some there were some uh, policies that were very sloppily introduced. So I know that one of the policies they introduced was that uh, and I, I, I talked to somebody from who was part of Al Qaeda. So I know what's going on behind the scenes with what these people are demanding of the locals. Um, one of the really ridiculous rules that the Chinese government put out was that they can't stop consuming media. So obviously, most people interpret that as Chinese state media. And you're like, well, what is that about? And they don't do a good job of explaining. Well, because one of the things that these terrorists terrorists were doing where they were forcing people to withdraw from society and only listen to their uh, uh, teachings. And so that was their way of counteracting it. Who, and, and it's a very sloppy. Who could force such a thing? The terrorists were forcing people to live that way. They were terrified by these people. How did they, they, they I mean, to do that? They, 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 they enlisted these people into this ideology. So like, for example, the person I talked to who graduated from the uh, vocational training center, he was recruited into this and he believed it. And so he wanted his, his daughter and his wife to start living a certain way also. I mean, that, that, I mean you, can see, you can see a similar thing happening with the Taliban also in terms of how they expect people to live. Now, the difference is here, um, I don't know about uh, Afghan history, but that history didn't exist in Xinjiang, and that was the real cultural genocide that that was going on, and and the the I, government that all the Uyghurs I've spoken to, no one has ever mentioned this as a as a problem. Um, what they point to is that legitimate things are not allowed. Um, you know, it's uh, uh... okay. So here's my here's my issue though. So there's a few points I want to wrap up. Okay, um, I think that. People need to be open minded to the fact that there's a huge part of this story that's being missed out, just like it was missed out in Hong Kong. And I can prove that more clearly with Hong Kong. Um, but, you know, because a lot of this stuff is it's already passed. It's already behind us and we can go through all the footage and stuff like that. The same kind of a thing is happening in Xinjiang. Only half of the story is being told. But the problem is, is this story is being propped up in such a way to serve America's geopolitical interests also. And that's why we got to be careful with it. It doesn't mean you can't look in and say, there's some crazy shit going on there that we need to talk about, but you need to be understood. People need to understand they're being used as a tool here. Their, their compassion is being weaponized to ramp up aggressions against China, also to sanction. I know you don't know much about the sanctions, but it all ties back in together to basically um, put actions in place that will make the people of Xinjiang suffer more than it will. And we, that's, that's something we have history behind us also is that when the U S goes in to try to save a people's in the name of human rights, they usually left, leave it way more effed up than when they, when they, when they started out, just like they did in Libya. And so even the lesson, I mean, even the Dalai Lama's brother who is anti-China writes this in his own book. He says the biggest regret he had in his life was uh, associating with the CIA and their narratives in Tibet, because if they got their way, Tibet would have been turned into another Libya, Syria, or Iraq. And 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 he's still he's not pro-China. He's still anti-China. But that's what's happening in Xinjiang. People are aligned with these groups of NED. Rushan Abbas is funded by them. All of these think tanks are funded by the U.S. government. And there's an ulterior motive going on here. So you really need to say, okay. Is this something we're really supposed to be getting excited about, especially considering that we're probably going to F things up even more than when we started out? I mean, that, that's one thing that should be the motive to allow people to then look a little bit deeper and say, OK, well, let's really look into these narratives. A million people in camps. Oh, it turns out it was from eight people. Forced labor. Oh, it turns out they don't actually have any evidence of this. The language is being eradicated. Oh, well, we don't have any evidence it's actually had any material effect as of yet. I mean, you know, it's, everybody's getting hyped up again about Xinjiang it, because people are being told that you need to be cared about, you need to care about this and you can care about it, but people have to be, people have to understand the, the role they're playing in this in terms of being used as a pawn for something far more nefarious. Uh, okay, great. I, I've got to leave now too, but I'll just say finally, I mean, okay, that, that's your opinion. I respect it. Um, my opinion is that both Hong Kong and Tibet and in Xinjiang, that the opposition to the Communist Party is spontaneous and is based on Chinese policy. So that's that's where I stand. So I don't I don't look at, you know, I don't I don't see uh, what, what you see. I know a lot of people think, you know, that America is behind every bad thing that happens. But I think the Communist Party is the culprit. In, in yeah, I mean, there's there there's a, there's a good reason why people think that they're behind a lot of things. But in Hong Kong, we have material evidence of the funding and the senators coming over. And it like I said, um, it wouldn't have would have happened without some U.S. Uh, involvement. 
No, I don't. I mean, I, I think uh, there definitely could have been uh, protests that happened. Protests have been a part of Hong Kong society for a long time, but I don't think it would have turned into the violent riots it did when they had all of this kind of uh, additional funding and support from the U.S. government, promises of visas to be able to escape afterwards, seeing their uh, protest he, leaders fly over to the U.S. Promising visas when he had no authority to do that. And that other guy, the the Chinese guy, is with him. His- he has well, well, somebody got it for him. He made the promise, and he has it. Uh, Bai Liang is now in the U.S. going on circuits, talking against the. You know, I mean, that? I'm sure if it's prominent people, you know, a Jimmy Lai or a Martin Lee, um, that they could get a visa. There's no problem. You don't need Steve Bannon to promise it. Um, but he had no authority. So if this guy got a visa, I doubt it had anything. Yeah, to- while while he had a, while he had a criminal record and he was on bail, um, yeah. and uh, he was still being he was still waiting to be charged. No, you need some special connections to still be able to get a visa to the U.S. And the reason he got a visa to the U.S. is because they knew he would go on these circuits and speak out against the uh, uh, the government here. Uh, from my point of view, there's enough evidence to say there's nothing organic about these movements. Okay. And um, yeah, but we'll we'll have to agree to disagree on that. But I, all I've got to say is. The stuff that I told you about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, with Xinjiang, the problem with Xinjiang, with us talking about Xinjiang, it's a lot of he said, she said, what you saw, what I saw with Hong Kong. I promise you, if you look up the stuff that I said about what actually happened on the ground mm-hmm. and the, what happened when ordinary Hong Kongers stood out against the protesters and the people that were killed by the protesters, I guarantee you, you will find a whole set of things that were hidden from you very deliberately to fit a certain narrative so that you can come to this conclusion that you've come to. Yeah, my, my experience though is like being, having been a journalist for close to 40 years is that I have a lot of friends who, who kind of take a similar argument. Oh, how come the, you know, this is not being reported that this has happened in Afghanistan. And I asked my friend, where did you find it? Oh, I read it in the New York Times. You know, I, I don't see that. I, you know, I see that, you know, there's things the media reports that I find kind of, you know, like the media, when they say, uh, when they talk about, you know, they did they cover up the attack in, in, in Kunming? Did they cover up the attack, the car guy who drove his car into the crowd in, in th- there? Did they, if you look, go back and read about the, the violence in, in 2009, nobody denies that Uyghurs attacked Han and Han Chinese were killed, you know? So I, I think it's kind of... Um, wait, wait, well, with the problem with Hong Kong is that it was over a year of very violent riots, extremely violent. Um, to the point where it's nothing short of coordinated, the fact that nobody knows even about a single event, a single item of how brutal these protesters were. I mean, you can't, that can't happen by mistake. And I can tell you with the reporters, uh, when you look at how reporters uh, from the BBC, for example, when they engage somebody who supports the mainstream narratives, like someone like Adrian Zenz or something like that, they'll ask them meaningful questions about their work. And what do they think is coming next? They'll engage them as an equal. When they speak to somebody who disagrees with the mainstream media narrative, like myself or something like that, right. completely superficial questions, like what does it feel like to be a mouthpiece to the Chinese Communist Party? It's like, Really? Do you want to actually ask me about my arguments? How Mm -hmm. about we talk about that BBC petition that 4,000 people signed a petition that want an answer on because you published clearly fake news about Xinjiang? Nobody's rep- nobody wants to respond to that. There is a when DW News when the when all of a sudden I don't know if you noticed it was suddenly okay to speak up for the Palestinians in a way that was never possible before. There were a lot of people talking about the plight of the Palestinians. DW News they came up with a memo that went out to all of their journalists saying when you report on this issue, this these are the do's and don'ts. Don't call it an apartheid. Don't do this. If somebody is killed on the Israeli side, they're killed. If somebody's killed on the Palestinian side, or, or they they died, and. These the entire mainstream mar- narrative is crafted, um, and uh, from my point of view, this exact same thing is happening in Xinjiang. I think um, we can we can we can disagree on that if you like, yeah. but the fact that this does happen and that's exactly what happened in Hong Kong, that is something that's far more difficult to uh, dispute at this point. I mean, I think it's also far di- very difficult to prove at the same time that there's some U.S. black hand behind these things. <laughs> The, the Hong Kong, uh, the Hong Kong, the Hong Kong has uh, uh, people on record right. uh, through USAGM, uh, mm-hmm. through their um, uh, open open IP or I forget what it was called. Uh, they're they're all they're on record. Like the U.S. government has admitted this. Uh, the documents are out there, so there there's no disputing that. That's for sure. Admitted what? The, the sorry. Admitted what? I'm sorry. They admitted that they've they put a considerable amount of funding into these groups, into these groups that uh, ultimately went on to protest these yeah. student groups and all these things. Um, well, my argument is that um, there's no smoking gun that the U.S. did this with what it, with the intention of creating, you know, kind of 
you know, uh, you know, kind of a social instability, you know, you know, it's like, cause they fund a group and then somebody beats up a construction worker doesn't mean, oh, there, that's tied together. What do you think? What do you think they're funding? I think they're funding the ability to have, you know, kind of democracy, to have freedom of speech, to be able to organize. You know, I don't see anything wrong with that. Oh, okay. So for foreign interference. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that kind of is the smoking gun. You know, I mean, they, you know, by the Chinese policy in Hong Kong. The, the sorry? You're not bothered by the Chinese policy. You seem to be very upset with what America is doing, but you don't have any problem with what what China what what, what, what policy? Taking over. You know, didn't China promise 50 years of autonomy, self-autonomy? Hong Kong is ranked the third freest place on earth Do, by the Cato Institute. The elections? How many people can vote in the elections? How many people can run for office now? How many people are being arrested for what they said? How many new, well, Yeah, there's a national security law in place now because there was an incredible yeah. amount of foreign interference that yeah. shouldn't have been allowed. Okay. I mean, that... that let's let's yeah. agree on that then because we could talk for another two hours. Uh, I, I want to thank you for the civil and polite conversation. The biggest... Uh, same to you. The biggest problem I have on Twitter is that as soon as I say something, I get called a fucking moron. They ask me how many babies I killed. <laughs> like, I don't want to debate with people. So, you know, tell your buddy... Uh, yeah. That, uh, if, if, like one that. thing I know, I, I know you might be uh, 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 on guard for this kind of thing, but the only thing I sent to you when you blocked me on Twitter was the uh, video of the ISIS um, saying, well, what is this then? Is this, you think the Ch Chinese government staged this? But I understand t t Twitter is a pretty toxic place. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate that we could uh, so, um, get. So are you uh, Daniel then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'm that. That's not my account. Mission critical. Yeah. I saw him communicating with you. That's not an alt account. Right. I promise. Right. I sent him a message. I said, "Listen, if you're going, because he said he's going for golf or something like that." And I said, "Listen, give him, um, give him the Streamyard account, and I'll, I'll talk to him then. Right. If you can't talk to him now, if, if I if I blocked you, I apologize because I don't rem actually don't remember. I remember somebody posting the video. I don't remember your name or actually talking to you. Daniel Dumbrell. Yeah, Daniel Dumbrell. Yeah. At, at the time, there was quite a few people who were attacking me personally. Right. OK. Um, yeah. So I just blocked a bunch of people. I'll, I'll put you back on. I mean, I'm, I'm fine if somebody's civil. What I, it bothers me is when yeah. people, and I find that a lot of people start arguing with somebody and and, you know, you kind of resist what they're saying. They immediately resort to insults and threats. And I just right. I, I don't need to. And, I'm, and a lot of people that I'm arguing with have never been to China. Um, or right. Yeah. I think a lot of times they're actually Chinese people masquerading because I mean, I see all the grammatical mistakes. And someone's claiming to be from Australia, and their name is Joe Smith, and they're and they're calling me mate. Then I become very suspicious. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, <laughs> that's something people have to reconcile too, though, is that um, it would be so much worse if there wasn't a firewall in China, because I can tell you the studies from the Harvard Institute saying that the Chinese government has ninety five percent support from their people is absolutely true. And I think if, if for the most part, if you're here, if you were here in China, I, well, it's got a lot better. It got a lot better in the last uh, I've been here for 13 years. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten considerably better in the last five years. But people overwhelmingly support their government, especially after they saw what happened with democracy in the U.S. Yeah. with Donald yeah. Trump, especially yeah. they see the covid handling and stuff like that. And I think that's what makes it annoying for a lot of people, too. It's like it's just like leave us to do our thing. Like, what do you got to come over here and do all this stuff? Hong Kong is a little bit of a different case. It's more of a 50-50 or 55-45 split. There's stuff going on. But still, there should be no reason for the U.S. to come in and, and have any part to do that, to help, yeah. even if it's in the name of promoting democracy, because that usually doesn't end well when they're involved. So my position is a position of non-interference. Uh, my position is, well, actually... There's there's a lot of things, and we could we could talk about that next time because I could go on forever. This was like we didn't even have a structure for what we were going to talk about, so I'm yeah. still pretty pleased that we covered a lot of things. Yeah. And like you said, it remains civil. But right. I've got a lot of reasons for having the position that I have, and I can understand from the perspective of other people when they get a little bit heated, they get frustrated when people can't see a certain perspective that we think is being ignored by the mainstream media. And hopefully, you know what? If you, I mean, if you unblock me and you see some of my ideas, you might not necessarily agree with all of them. I, I recommend my video with the uh, ex Al Qaeda guy, also um, uh, the guy who was associated with Al Qaeda, uh, who talks about how this is a lot of recycled propaganda, also. Um, mm -hmm. But you know what? I, I, and I, I regularly, like I said, I look through Sean Roberts' book, also. I'm constantly looking at the other side, and I think that's what people need to do: is they need to reach across the other side. So, and and this conversation was in the spirit of that as well, which I appreciate. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks a lot. And uh, yeah. All right. Have a good day. You too, you too. Take care.